Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the January 27th, 2020 Town of Scarborough Planning Board meeting. If all of you could rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation. Thank you. Doreen, could you call the roll, please? Nicholas McGee. Here. Rachel Hendrickson. Here. Roger Beely. Here. Richard DuPerry. Here. Jennifer Ladd. Here. Rick Munking. Here. Thank you. And please let the record show that uh, Robin is not here this evening, so uh, Rick DuPerry will be a voting member. Uh, next, we have the approval of the minutes from January 6, 2020. So moved. I get a motion. Do we have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Opposed? Hey, so that is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, next item of business is the election of officers. Uh, we have the chair, the vice chair, and the secretary as officers available. Uh, do we have any motions for any of those positions? Roger. Yes, um, Mr. Chair, I make a motion that um, Mr. McGee uh, remain as um, chair, uh, Ms. Ms. Uh, Hendrickson becomes vice chair, and yours truly remains as secretary. Do we have any other nominations? If so, I'll enter, uh, entertain a, a vote on the slate for McGee for chair, Hendrickson for vice chair, and Beely for secretary. All in favor? So that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you again for the <coughs> opportunity to serve as your chair. That's, that's my role. <laughs> uh, next, we have the election of committee appointees. We have two uh, positions we need to fill, the Long Range Planning Committee and the Transportation Committee uh, is from representatives from this board. Uh, Robin Saunders currently um, serves as our Long Range Planning Committee uh, liaison, and Roger Beely currently serves as our Transportation Committee liaison. Uh, <clears throat> let's open the floor for nominations to those positions, please. I'll nominate Roger for Transportation Committee. Second. And do we have, I'll nominate Robin for Long Range Planning Committee. Second. Anyone else? Nominations? Seeing no others, I'm going to close nominations. All in favor of Roger for transportation and Robin for uh, long range planning. Show is unanimous. Thank you very much. Next item of business is Ballantyne Development LLC requests a site plan review for lots 128A and 128B, North Village, Assessor's Map R73, Lot 21A. Jay? <coughs> Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as you just noted, this is a site plan uh, application for North Village, which is part of the uh, Eastern Village subdivision. Um, let's see, so what the applicant is proposing is uh, five multifamily residential buildings consisting of 84 total apartments um, served by public streets and other public utilities. Um, and there are a host of other improvements from garages, a community building, uh, fenced in dog park, natural trail, um, and other amenities within the public uh, proposed public right, rights of way. Um, let's see, so this application was last before the board in September. Um, and so the applicant provided some review, uh, revised materials and uh, response to staff comments and, and board comments. And at this point, um, I think just highlighting some of the things you've received in your staff comments as well as comments from our traffic engineer and civil uh, peer review engineer are um, one thing that was identified that uh, we understand the applicant has received their DEP permit, um, but the town did not receive any stormwater or grading plans with this submission, so we haven't had an opportunity to do a local review of those elements. Um, there's discussion from our, our uh, traffic peer reviewer about um, questions regarding uh, updated traffic safety uh, analysis at the intersections. Um, there's really three main, main intersections. Um, and there's actually also a comment from the applicant's uh, traffic engineer about uh, receiving an update from the DOT um, related to the need uh, trying to get an understanding if they would require an updated traffic movement permit. So um, we're not sure if the applicant has reached out to DOT on that respect yet. Um, and I'll say the traffic also sort of relates back to a, in, um, a prior condition of approval that this board granted back in 2017 that had sought there to be additional traffic analysis prior to the uh, development of phase seven. 
phase seven is, you know, I think it's roughly 16 single family uh, uh, units. Um, and so really just try to understand how, where this phase fits in and sort of what the um, uh, timing of all, all those improvements would be and what phases would come first and understanding how that reconciles with the prior condition of approval. Um, and then last item I'll just sort of flag at this point is the board based on the zoning uh, standards that uh, requires sidewalks to be connected to um, uh, from the site or from developments within the uh, TND to other amenities. Um, the applicant was asked to look at uh, design and construction of a sidewalk along Ward Street and at this time um, they've suggested that uh, they just want to do a contribution towards that end. Um, however, staff in accordance with the zoning ordinance would continue to suggest that um, that be um, something that be part of the development. I will note I did have a chance to have a conversation, a very brief conversation with our town manager um, earlier today and um, the town certainly open to uh, having a discussion with the applicant about you know what type of public private um, um, uh, partnership there might be based on the extent of those improvements and what it currently is out there but um, without any sort of you know, knowledge of the, the exact details but um, anyway uh, I think those are my highlights at this point and certainly happy to answer questions oh I did want to make mention I'm sure you're about to make mention of it but we have received a host of emails and letters from folks um, who live in the neighborhood and, and other uh, property owners and those have been provided to the board um, and are part of the public record thank you Jay I appreciate it uh, for anyone here that is uh, looking to maybe speak on this topic uh, just if you hadn't been here before, first we let the applicant do his presentation to the board, uh, then we'll open it up for public comment, and then the board will deliberate on all of the information provided. So uh, with that, Carrie, <coughs> would you like to uh, please address at least some of the uh, more pressing major issues that have been outlined, and then anything else that uh, you might find that the board weighing in on at this time would help you going forward. Okay, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Carrie Anderson, Ballantyne Development. <coughs> to... Um, to uh, go down through the, uh, I believe, the staff comments. Uh, with me here tonight is also uh, Sean McGilvery, who can uh, talk to the architectural aspects of the development, and Steve Bushy for uh, technical uh, side of it with engineering. Uh, with respect to the sidewalk, we did look at the sidewalk work, and going up uh, Ward Street is it's not an ideal situation. There's conflicts with the right-of-way, the telephone poles that are on both sides in an area where sidewalks would need to be, along with uh, uh, the intersection and whatnot. And what we uh, essentially did was we said, well, you know, we'll, we'll give, make a contribution to the town of $10,000 uh, towards that. We don't have a problem sitting down with the town and in good faith trying to find some way that we can work with the town to achieve some of that work. We just want that to be bilateral rather than unilateral. Uh, the architecture aspect of it, which is the next comment in the staff comments, Sean can get to here in just a few minutes. But I will note that the buffering plan that you see here on the board, we've added approximately <coughs> 86 trees along the perimeter to uh, address some of the concerns that the, uh, the abutters had uh, with respect to the, uh, the development. And we also have a, uh, a plan showing uh, the building scale in relation to Eastern Village, the distance back and whatnot. I wanna make note that this is 84 units on 15 acres. South Village is 53 units on just over one and a half acres. So there's a uh, significant distance and difference in the area and also the dis distance back that uh, you'd view these both from the street and from opposing uh, project uh, properties and we can get into that more when Sean does his uh, his presentation there as far as the traffic goes the uh, we don't read that uh, traffic quite the way that um, maybe uh, you do mr. Uh, J we uh, we look sorry we look at it as um, something that we did do counts out there and based on the counts and based on north village at full build out and the additional phases of eastern village when built at full build out uh, increases the am uh, p 
peak by 41 trips and the PM by seven. That's it. Uh, so it's significantly under what our uh, estimates were that we've been saying all along. The other thing is, uh, and, St and Steve can talk to this more, the other thing is, is uh, North Village, once built, will not trigger any of those, uh, uh, re uh, a letter from DOT, a revised TMP, none of that will come into play once North Village is built. It's only once the remaining phases of Eastern Village are built that triggers that. Also, the other thing that that doesn't contemplate is Ward Street <clears throat> being included, because right now the counts were done at Eastern Road and at Commerce Drive. Once Ward Street's included, it further disperses the traffic. So we did what we were asked to do, which was go out and count trips and look at that. Um, but uh, we don't believe there's any issue there. And, and Steve can, can talk to that certainly more than I can. Uh, the grading uh, plan, we can get a revised grading plan to the town. Uh, we'd like to do that as a condition. What we did do on the site is we lowered the site. None of the inverts or slopes changed in any of the stormwater. Uh, the site simply came down and uh, for bringing in less material into the site. And Steve, Steve can talk to that point when he gets up. The phasing in, in uh, North Village, we do have it split in two phases. Our shop is currently on the Ward Street side of the project and we need to work out of that shop uh, to get as much of the project completed as we can before we essentially have to pack up and move out. So that's the reason why we have it phased the way that we do. Uh, we have no problem with making the last building closest to Ward Street uh, conditional upon a seal for that particular building with the completion of that section once our shop is gone. But that's the reason why we have the phasing on this plan like we do. The other note that came in in staff comments was changing the overall phasing plan of the project. We really don't want to do that for a couple reasons. When we make a phasing plan change, there's a lot of other agencies that are involved in having to have the same accurate phasing information. The big one is CMP, and it takes a long time to get a what's called a 905, which is a revised electrical layout from CMP based on phasing. And I've had several discussions with them over the project over the years. And every time I talk to them and they say, is the phasing plan accurate? And I say, well, it's not because we've changed it like we've been asked to in the past. They kind of get frustrated and say, all right, well, we'll have to start the whole process all over again. We're going to need a new 905 and on and on and on. And that's the same case with other uh, agencies as well. Uh, what I will say is when you phase a project like Eastern Village, you give it your best guess. And um, it's not uncommon to develop a phase outside of its chronological order. So we would like to leave the phasing plan as it, as it is today. A couple of other comments that came was the 90 foot separation between driveways uh, on Camden Street for North Village. Eastern Village geometrics are uh, very liberal in, in, in this area here and, and we're just designing the same way we are in trying to keep with, uh, with the Eastern Village geometrics which were approved by the board back in 07. Uh, so we'd, we'd like to keep that distance there. And then there's a 25 foot distance separation in the parking areas uh, from the 22. The road going down through was originally 20 feet. Uh, town staff asked us to increase that to 22, which we did. Uh, we're just trying to make the parking aisle uh, within the parking areas the same as it may make it 22. It's essentially no bigger than the road. So if, if cars are passing on Camden Street at 22 feet, we don't see why there's any, any need to make a wider area in the parking aisles uh, when cars are going to be going much slower. It's going to uh, create more impervious area. It's going to impact more wetlands. And it's something that we really don't want to do. There was a note, there was a comment about uh, making sure that there was 10 foot of separation between all buildings on the site. 
it's the plan has been updated and been labeled showing the distances there are no distances that are 10 feet or less and the other thing i want to make note of is all the uh, exterior building materials in all the buildings in north village are all non-combustible materials and 10 feet is the allowed distance uh, for eastern village and north village as long as you're using non-combustibles the next thing is uh, there was a comment about the uh, auto turn simulation being provided i met with jim butler today and gave him the two auto turn simulations that were in the package that was submitted for this meeting um, I don't know, but Jim Butler is satisfied with those turning simulations. I met with him this afternoon. He has no issues with, with that whatsoever. Another comment that came in was about the 150 foot distance from the road down to the end of a parking area, not being any more than that. Given that the buildings are set up close to the street and when you pull into the parking areas, you encounter the buildings almost essentially immediately, he has no issue with those separation, with that distance at all. He is fine with the plan as it's shown today. He did ask for us for it to uh, include one more hydrant in the plan and I wasn't able to get that to Steve Bushy in time this afternoon for that change to be made. But instead of two hydrants on Camden Street, there's now going to be three. And he's good with the hydrant placement based on that change that we will make. Lighting, we submitted uh, the town fixture that um, we plan on using both down Camden Street and in the parking areas. And it's my understanding uh, in working with the town in the past, and maybe things have changed, we can certainly get a photometric plan to the town, but as long as we're using the town approved fixture, um, I haven't had that request asked of me in the past, but we have no problem making that uh, condition if we need to get a photometric plan into the town. Uh, but we are planning on using the, the town approved fixture. A uh, comment was asked about signage. We have no signage that we're proposing for the project. The signage will essentially be the building addresses on Camden Street. It's a public street. The, uh, the address will be on the building uh, as they're shown, which was submitted. There is no signage other than that. It's like driving down a street. You get to an address, that's your residence. We're not trying to announce it's North Village or anything else. And that number system was approved by public safety. They're, they're all set with, uh, with the number system as it, numbering system as it was submitted. There was a comment about lot 140 and resubmitting a, plan, a revised plan that takes the uh, word proposed off that lot. We will make that change and, and on the subdivision plan and, and get that into the town at the next submission. A, uh, there was a uh, staff had a comment about uh, coming up with uh, in a maintenance agreement for the uh, common areas within the right of way of Camden Street to be maintained by uh, somebody other than the town. We did submit today this afternoon a maintenance agreement that uh, spells out those obligations uh, are are on North Village, uh, essentially the sidewalks, the esplanades, the town's. Uh, uh, responsibility will will really uh, uh, end at uh, at the plowing of the roads, which is uh, the, which is what Eastern Village uh, is contemplated as now, and that's in perpetuity. And that that uh, maintenance agreement was submitted to the town today. Uh, there was a comment about having a second means of egress out of the community building. There's currently two means of egress out of that building now. Uh, I talked with Jim Butler about that this afternoon. He said, fine. He said, uh, I'm all set. He said, when you come in to get a permit, he said, we'll just need to take a look at the use. And if there's another uh, egress point, he says, you'll just have to build a sidewalk wherever that's out, out to the sidewalk. I, I said, no problem there. We have no issue with that whatsoever. We have received our state permit um, and we've also received our federal permit. Our federal permit received months ago. Um, happy to answer any and all questions, uh, Mr. Chairman. It's been a long, uh, been a long time uh, uh, going through this project and we feel like 
we really just have some uh, conditions here that can be uh, addressed in a housekeeping issue and uh, respectfully request uh, an approval. Thank you. Thank you. Is that uh, all for the team right now? I'm sorry? That's, that's all the presentation from the team? Uh, no, I can get you architecture and also uh, engineering as well. If you have questions? Yeah. Thank you. Sean McGilvery, EMI Kellermore Architects. Are you able to put a, are you able to put up the package from architectural on the screen? Should be 20, 20 sheets. Uh, for the comparison. If we can go to slide three. Taking in the comments from the last meeting, we have uh, done a side by side comparison of project density. Uh, this is showing what Kerry was just describing, the difference between South Village on the left-hand side and North Village on the right-hand side, and the scale of the building, scale of the site, and getting an idea on paper to scale of what each of these looks like side by side. There's, uh, Kerry gave the stats on how many units and the area of each site, and the graphic here on the, might show up a little better on the, presentation board here shows all the, the buildings and solid block color. The next slide would be four. If we can get onto four, we can talk about the, so the, there is some known elements and scale that we wanted to show in comparison to North Village. This happens to be inspiration, the inspiration townhouse is on the green. What we have here, of course, on the left-hand side is the elevations showing the size and scale of these, of these buildings that are, that are built right now. On the right-hand side, we have an image of that. And below, there's a distance from where you'd be standing at the sidewalk to the face of these buildings to give you an idea of we got 150 feet from that sidewalk to the building, 120 feet. And up in the top right-hand corner is a silhouette of what that building looks like and the height of that building in comparison to the street, to give you a reference. When we go on to slide number five, what I've done here is I've, I'm showing the North Village site plan in the lower right-hand corner. I, of course, have the elevations of the closest buildings to the adjacent homeowner lots, which is building one, and, uh, which is on Ballantine, and then building three, which would be closest to Inspiration from the backyards. The distances shown are silhouetted in the top right-hand corner to give you an idea of the size and scale of these buildings compared to what's built out there and um, has been accepted uh, on, uh, inspiration, on the Inspiration townhouses. Building one would be the closest building in this case. And what I've done in the top right-hand corner, you can see there is a a silhouette of the Inspiration townhouses and the point of view being the person standing in that yard in red and looking and this building being an additional 30 feet back from that closest point will appear to be in perspective a very similar um, view. Same can be said for you know building building three which is actually even you know twice the distance uh, 300 feet away and the silhouette of the townhouses would appear closer. You're, you're quite a distance away from those backyards. And as we've discussed before, the Inspiration townhouses being built are two and a half stories. They have taller ceilings. That overall build is slightly shorter than what we're building here, but the distance of these buildings is further away. And we are, to reiterate from the last conversation, matching the architectural details of the Inspiration townhouses that you've seen. Uh, we took the comments in from what we've, you know, what, what's been told to us about the architecture that's been built there and tying into that, being sympathetic. This is matching that at a larger scale because they are slightly taller buildings. That, that sums up the architectural changes since the last presentation. Mr. Chairman, Steve Bushy with Goral Palmer. Just a couple of things to uh, uh, build upon. 
uh, Carrie mentioned the traffic piece, and I'll uh, offer for you. Gore Plummer did uh, an additional traffic count study, provided a memo, report to you folks, give you a summary of where we stand on the traffic movement permit uh, that was approved way back when, and the numbers now that will be uh, uh, increased with the North Village project. That results basically in seven additional PM trip ends. That won't trip anything relative to a need for an amendment for the traffic movement permit. Uh, Randy Dutton, our traffic consultant, who was a former division engineer, knows these things inside and out, said uh, the protocol with DOT is uh, 99 additional trips beyond what you've been previously approved would trigger the need for an amendment. We're only at seven. But to Mr. Bray's uh, comments, he's asked that we, as a courtesy, contact DOT and alert them of where we stand. I think Mr. Bray had suggested that that could be something we could provide you folks uh, subsequent to uh, future approvals here uh, or the next phase of activity. Certainly happy enough to do that. And in fact, I know Randy in our office will be submitting that information to the DOT again as a courtesy. But that's where we stand relative to the traffic movement permit. Effectively, we're still uh, within good standing as to the original permit approval, despite the fact that we are adding a new piece of development activity to Eastern Village. Secondly, the grading and drainage plan, uh, we will be providing that. It hadn't been provided simply because our original submission, uh, other than the changes in grade on a few of the buildings, everything else effectively stayed uh, the same. Uh, I'll note, and we do have our DEP permit, the things that they approved and our approach to uh, drainage and stormwater management as we had indicated to you back in our earlier meetings includes some, I think, relatively unique and special things for this development. We're incorporating porous pavement as a special feature for stormwater management, uh, drip strips around the perimeters of the buildings as well, and then recognizing that uh, the majority of this new development will continue to drain to the large wet pond. Those of you who've maybe traveled on the Eastern Road and seen a very large pond that was constructed as part of Eastern Village uh, accounts for stormwater management uh, as well uh, for this particular development. So in that regard, we're in pretty good shape, we feel. Uh, besides all of our other utility pieces, we have gotten sanitary sewer district approval, Portland Water District approval, and the like. So on the technical side of things, Carrie's gone through some of that. I believe mostly cleanup items, and that's why we're here before you tonight, uh, hopeful in uh, uh, an approval action. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I turn it back to the board. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, we do have opportunity for public comment. Uh, if you'd like to speak on this subject, I would ask that you please approach the podium, state your name, and um, we're going to limit everyone to four minutes. I do a little courtesy tap when you've got 30 seconds to wrap it up. So just a little heads up that you should try to wind down at that point at four minutes. I do bang it, and that is, that is the end of your time allotted. So with that, welcome the first guest. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mark Bauer of Jensen Baird, Gardner and Henry, uh, represent, here representing Nancy Pack and Jim Marshall at 7 Inspiration Drive. I uh, would like to just mention a few of the comments um, uh, on things that have been touched on already. First, on buffering. Section 4F10 of the ordinance requires buffer shall be provided to shield structures and uses from the view of abutting properties where the abutting properties would otherwise be adversely impacted. What's being shown now are red maples and Colorado blue spruce, uh, which are only going to be six to eight feet tall, and, and they're being proposed with gaps in between. Uh, we, would rec we would recommend that this is not sufficient for, for the size and scale of the project that's being developed. The red maples will not provide screening for roughly half the year as deciduous trees. The ordinance does not contemplate large spreading deciduous trees for buffering. Uh, given the density of the proposed development, we're talking 86 additional units with large buildings. Uh, this is not a more robust plan is essential. Next, is there a written uh, landscape maintenance plan as required under section 4F9A? Um, haven't seen one, and I think there's a concern about planting in areas on the plan that are shown as wetlands. Um, and so there's a concern that those won't survive. If you look at some of the plantings of the, the red maples in Colorado blue spruce, uh, we'd like to see a condition of approval um, regarding survival of plantings um, as well. It's 
I also would suggest that perhaps berms would be a better option for providing buffering as opposed to um, what's being currently proposed, which is nothing other than uh, you know a few trees and, and shrubs. On traffic, I'll, I just would mention too, parking lots do not appear to be landscaped uh, per ordinance requirements. Traffic, uh, the Goral Palmer analysis admits that the proposed development will exceed the number of originally permitted trips for East Village, and that's 40 a.m., uh, that, that was not mentioned, uh, 40 a.m. and 7 p.m. trips. Um, we would suggest also that the connection uh, of Camden Street to Ward Street should occur first, then build from that opening toward Ballantyne, not the other way around, uh, in order to, to mitigate the traffic impact of this, this uh, proposed uh, uh, development also during the construction period. Um, we request a condition of approval for that, before, uh, to, for that to be completed before the construction begins, in addition to have the landscaping and, and, and buffering done before construction begins as well. Um, lighting, section 4H for outdoor site lighting. Uh, there does not appear to be a site uh, a lighting plan as requested by the planning board previously and as required by the ordinance. Um, that is a submission requirement. Um, and for my clients are particularly concerned about um, the lighting on the storage buildings and the parking areas. Um, I know that they're perhaps pr approved fixtures, but where they're going to be and how many there are going to be, I think a, a photometric plan would be appropriate uh, and should be required. Um, Building design, it does not appear that the color of uh, the buildings has, has changed um, contrary to the, to the board's prior comments on that. And then finally, on financial and technical capability, uh, based on the, the, the sort of uh, partially finished uh, projects in Eastern Village and Southern Village, there's the concern that the developer lacks the financial and technical capability uh, to complete the North Village, and we would suggest a condition of approval on this issue as well, whether it's a performance guarantee, letter of credit, or um, some other condition of approval that would be appropriate to ensure that, uh, that the project will be completed in a timely fashion and not have um, unfinished projects. That's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jim Marshall at Seven Inspiration. Thank you all for all of your hard work. Uh, it's a, a totally thankless job, but we all appreciate the hard work that you do. And um, I just want to address three things. First of all, the fabric of the neighborhood. <clears throat> when we bought into Eastern Village as homeowners uh, five years ago, we really loved the vision of the community, a small village feel, uh, where we'd have houses of high quality and great design. So that when I looked out my window, I'd see a beautiful home and my neighbors would see the same thing when they looked out their windows as well. And I really don't feel that uh, the, the project as it currently stands does a good enough job of integrating uh, into the design of Eastern Village. And I would love, you know, I'd love to see a better architectural design study done, which brings me to my second point. Uh, I don't feel at this point uh, the design of the of the community, considering that it's very tight and it will have an impact on its neighbor, integrates uh, enough architecturally and with the village feel in its present format. So I'd, I'd ask that just, again, we don't put the number of apartments we can get into one place. That has been the, the objective, is to maximize that piece of real estate to yield the highest number of apartments and the most profit, design has come second. I feel like design has uh, been, you know, done to, you know, the design issues have been addressed partially, but I think that they're done as an afterthought. And really what's, uh, what the, the main focus is, maximizing the number of apartments and the amount of profit. And the third thing is the ordinance. Um, my understanding is that the present plan allows for the maximum number of apartments that you can put on this piece of land. And uh, you do not have to approve a plan that has that number of apartments. You can reduce the footprint, pull it back from the abutting, um, abutting neighbors, put in more robust uh, uh, buffering as well. So again, I'm concerned about the fabric of the villages that has is that we love the vision of the community, we'll be affected by this. We don't think that the design, uh, that there has been a, a thoughtful design study that integrates it with the rest of the village. And finally, that this maxes out the ordinance. And I'd love to see a smaller 
if it's going to get built a smaller uh, footprint that pulls it away from its neighbors because I can tell you uh, in some of the uh, illustrations I saw before of the southern village that has gone in um, I know that those neighbors are not happy about the looking out and seeing the buildings that they see and on this design plan certainly where uh, Ballantyne meets I guess it's Camden um, again the 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 sight lines, it's just a very, very tight fit. So thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Carolyn Inglis. Is that, can you hear me? Okay, at Four Traditional Street. Um, I concur with Mark's comments. I have three points to make tonight, although there are many I could address. But my first point is that before any other construction, the Ward Street Camden Way intersection should be created, and then a road to Ballantyne from Ward to Ballantyne, so that the work can start at Ward Street and move toward Ballantyne for a number of reasons. Second point is, I would like to see duplexes and single family homes, one both, on this property and on Camden Way, really in order to keep Carrie's original vision of Eastern Village alive. Phase eight then, which is this, uh, will be more in keeping with and reflective of most of the EV homes nearby. Third point, multiple times a day, school buses pick up and or drop off and pick up kids at the corners of Commerce and Ballantyne. Although some parents drop their kids off and wait for the kids to get on the bus and wait for the bus and get their kids in their cars, there are some students who walk there along Ballantyne to catch the bus and to come home from the bus. Adding large, loud, and generally fast construction vehicles to that mix should be a big concern. Having that Ward Street access to Camden could alleviate some of that. Emergency vehicles will also then have a faster access to our neighborhood. Thus, my three things. First, connect Ward and Camden and build toward Ballantyne. Second, duplexes or homes to keep the feel, as Jim Marshall has said, of the village we paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to live in uh, and expected. And third, the safety issues, both of vehicles, trucks, people, this is our neighborhood, and we care about it, and we're very concerned about it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Jim Inglis. I live at 4 Traditional Street. Every developer has their capabilities and the reputation that they have earned. I ask you to keep that in mind for this proposal as you review its impact, completeness, and specificity. There are many, many concerns about this proposal. Here are a few to supplement the written statement I submitted last week. There remain many items uncompleted for Eastern Village phases that are supposed to be completed and those in progress. Sidewalk repairs and installations, planting of trees along streets, constructions of Reflections Park, now occupied by a large pile of dirt. The list goes on and on. These should all be fully completed, no waivers, no exceptions, before any work on a phase eight would be allowed to start. The proposal in the larger scale, if you look at it here, it, uh, <clears throat> the overall building site is as far from Ward Street as possible. Ward Street is where the developer lives. 
It's accomplished by jamming it up against Ballantyne Avenue houses. The whole layout should be readjusted to be closer to Ward Street and further from Ballantyne. Okay. Given the parking problems in Eastern Village and South Village, please look extra carefully at the parking plans in the proposal. Okay. Many possible situations are ones to consider. For example, is there enough room for a four-door pickup truck to turn around at the end of a parking aisle if a parking space isn't found? Is there enough room for a tow truck to tow out a four-door pickup truck from a parking space in a full lot? Okay. Finally, please repeat your request to the developer to hold a neighborhood meeting. Okay. Communication is good. An opportunity to explain the rationale for a proposal and correct any misperceptions. After all, most attendees would be neighbors of the developer on Ward Street, where he lives, and Eastern Village occupants of houses he built. Without a meeting, some might wonder, what's he trying to hide? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Larry Weinberg. I live at 2 Ballantyne. Uh, a couple observations that I'd like to make a comment. My house is the first house in the neighborhood. The access point of, I guess, Camden to Ballantyne uh, should be a fire gate only. There's so much activity and volume of traffic coming down Ballantyne. We have a ring doorbell, as many of our neighbors do. It's over 500 to 600 dings a day with multiple cars going down that road. I don't understand on the traffic uh, survey that was done why there wasn't pressure strips on all the intersections to be able to track accurately the amount of traffic that comes into that street. Ward should go continue all the way into Eastern Village. It's ridiculous there's only one way to get out of Eastern Village where you can get a light because Black Point Road and Eastern Trail there should be a light there so you can make a left-hand turn. Otherwise all that traffic continues, the construction vehicles, the bus, all the other car traffic is nonstop. We have a hard enough time at certain points during the day of get backing out of the driveway. And that's something that doesn't seem to be looked at. In terms of our estimation as a resident homeowner of Eastern Village, the remaining two sections, section seven and eight, I'm sorry, six and seven, need to be completed. The infrastructure, the utilities, the roadways, all need to be completed there's a very good chance that those developments will be extended and extended and not done for the next four or five years. The housing market is very strong right now. If you look at the uh, time it's taken to get to the recent construction in Eastern Village, the Eastern Village should have been completed by now. The other issue which I want you to look at is the density of the rental units. When you look at North Village and you look at South Village, the residents, the tenants of those units exceed and will exceed the homeowners in EVA. And we made a very strong investment in our community, in our HOA. And to have the occurrence of tenants, and I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, but when it overcomes the neighborhood and the HOA, South Village, most of the tenants in those apartments have multiple dogs. They're large dogs. They don't pick up. We have a dog. We have a number of uh, homeowners in the neighborhood that have pets. We're very conscious of it. They're not. We have more increase in the amount of waste from South Village, and we're going to have the same thing in North Village. The impact is very great to us. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Robert Mood. I live at 26 Ballantyne, which is lot number 136. Um, I think it's very telling in the opening comments from the applicant that he didn't touch on the response to the question, staff continues to encourage the applicant to coordinate a neighborhood meeting prior to future submissions to the board. 
he didn't touch on it because he answered it in the negative. For me, I think it really underscores how thankful I am for this opportunity for you to hear my voice, to read the comments of my neighbors, and to take that into account. And how critical it is to me for you all to be able to take action on our behalf because clearly we don't have another voice. <clears throat> I think for me it's a pretty simple ask. If you have to produce apartments in this space, produce less of them, make a bigger buffer, and address the impact that it's going to have on our neighborhood. The architecture noted a moment ago about the space over on the townhomes on Inspiration and the measurements and the arcs and the things of that nature. It's not a good analogy because if you look at the drawing on lot 126, which is mine, the 150 foot mark is actually drop, drawn to my neighbor's home. You swing that arc into my house, it's considerably less than 150 feet. The other problem that I have with that is when you look at those townhomes, as noted, they are only two story. The upper is just a dormer. That unit that is going to be there, looking into my backyard, staring into my back windows, is a 12 one unit apartment complex. Six of those will be looking directly into my home, into my backyard. The other thing is that if you also notice, the inspiration drawing has a very nice green space from that space to those townhomes. For me, I'm looking at parking lots. I'm looking at a trash receptacle. It will be the first thing that I smell when I walk out my back door. Additionally, there is a snow storage spot that has been placed between my lot and this lot. I think that my desire would be obviously to remove this piece of infrastructure and this associated apartment building. I think that that would naturally increase the buffer to Eastern Village. I think it would decrease the overall impact of the traffic. And then I think it would also help with the wetlands impact that this development is going to have on the area. You received a letter from me last August, I believe, and one today. And in the letter today, I have pictures from the back of my property. Today, with no development, I have a flooding problem in my yard every time that it rains of any degree of significance. Along the back of our property, you can see where the water from snow melt then freezes and turns a giant ice rink. <clears throat> it was spoken about earlier, and I did not get any details of this, but I don't see a stormwater plan. I'm concerned about the southern edge of this property and the runoff of that and how it will not only impact my property, my neighbor's property, but how it will also impact Ballantyne Pond, which is where I believe this water runs into, which is not controlled by the app. Again, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you listening to me. Again, my ask is really simple. If you gotta put apartments here, just make less of them and give us a little bit of a better buffer. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I'm Norma Weinberg. I also live at Two Ballantyne. Um, I agree with everything my husband said. The one thing that really affects me is I don't, I haven't, I don't have a fenced in yard and I do walk my dog through the neighborhood all the time. And as he said, the amount of dog waste out there right now is horrendous. We pick up from our dog any, up to three bags on a walk but there are so many people that don't pick up and if these apartments even though they have a dog run and they don't utilize it and they walk in the neighborhood it's just more and more dogs um, our dog is semi well trained um, he does not bark at other dogs even when they're aggressive to him but there are some dogs that bark at us this morning we had one that was really large and was pulling the lady across the street towards us. And my dog and I was, pull, you know, I had him on his leash and I put him on a shorter leash because I don't want a confrontation with another dog. 
and he's 80 pounds and I mean, yes, I outweigh him. But I, that's another thing I worry about the animals that will come in. And yes, I'm sure not all of my neighbor's dogs are trained either. But it, it, it's a scary thing as an owner. Um, the buses that stop on Commerce and Valentine, and it's only twice a day, but some days I've had to move, have cars move because they're blocking my driveway. And the, I mean, they're, they're, that's a big amount of space. But the other thing that I really was concerned about was in one of the letters that um, you all received, there is also, um, it says, Valentine plans on building a 3,000 square foot of office space and two one bedroom apartments and 49 single family housing units in Eastern Village um, while proposing 12 studio apartments and 48 one bedroom. I know that's in North Village, but I'm concerned is where is this 3,000 square foot building going? Because when I look at the plans, and this doesn't include all of Ballantyne. The yellow is what is developed in this plan. The blue green are like common areas and the only places that this office building can go that it, this is a non-residential um, in a single family and this is a non-residential in a single family but I think a house is going in there. And then over here, is a non-residential, single family, multiple family. So I'm concerned where is this other building going and what's gonna be in it if it's an office building because these are all homes. And you know, I when I first looked here, I was told that in these apartments, there might be some businesses in here, but these are all apartments. So now I'm curious, like, where this other building is going. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other owner comments? All right. Seeing none, I'm gonna close the owner comments section of this, uh, turn it over for the board for deliberation. Uh, so we have um, there's a lot to sift through here. Um, Rachel, do you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. Um, that you're right. There's a lot to sift through here. Um, I guess I'm going to ask kind of some global questions just to see what possibilities are. Uh, Carrie, one of the things that we've heard is the the concern about the closeness of the buildings in the parking lots uh, to the Ballantine Drive and to the houses on there. And as I look at the plan, there does seem to be space down near Ward Street. What are the possibilities of moving the development closer, kind of picking it up and moving it closer to Ward to provide more space and buffering in between the Ballantine houses and the beginning of uh, this development? Well, the first thing I'd start out by saying is there was a neighborhood meeting September 2018, and everybody that's gotten up so far that I've seen was at that meeting. The only comment that came out of that meeting was, uh, please don't in, uh, tie the road in at Classical, which is why you see the walking path that goes up there. The other thing I'd say is uh, in the bulk and space requirements, this project is farther away from all affected by a significant amount. It might be close to one homeowner, the one that got up and spoke that lives on Ballantyne, but, uh, but houses, if there was houses built, uh, they've got houses right next door to them that are closer. Uh, Eastern Village is a uh, dense neighborhood. The zoning overlaying that whole area is dense. The bulk and space requirements are uh, very liberal. We have designed a project that uh, fits within the area with the least amount of wetland impacts. Uh, it's been engineered. We've got our permits. Um, you know, we're, we're ready to go. Um, at this point, uh, I have, you know, the buffering plan 
is 86 additional trees. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have done a lot to try and address the concerns. And I think what this is really all about is apartments. And that's unfortunate because it's a permitted use. It's a need in the community. We still get well over uh, 200 calls a month. Uh, just Northeast University was in Portland today talking about their plans. Where are people going to live? There's a massive housing problem. And we're just, uh, you know, we're trying to um, uh, build something that will address that, like a lot of other individuals are. Uh, and, and I understand that, but I really am trying to find to see if there's any place um, where there can be adjustments to really address some of the concerns. It's, uh, well, obviously, I, I would guess one adjustment is a lot more trees, and you've added, clearly added a lot more uh, and a lot more landscaping, but it takes a while for landscaping to fill in. Uh, uh, so the potential is to add more trees. I, as I look at this plan, I'm looking at, and I, I've, on uh, C3.1 is what I'm looking at, uh, simply I, I see um, what are the potentials, for instance, of switching the 12-unit apartment building uh, and its adjoining parking spaces with a garage so that instead of seeing a three-story building, that building is moved much further back and instead there's a garage there and the parking lot is moved further back. So, I mean, I'm trying to get at some potential design issues that may address some of these, these concerns that, that people have. And I understand, you know, we're kind of down the pike, but at this point it's been a continuing issue um, I, and I understand the need for apartments, and I think uh, apartments tend to bring young families in, uh, young professional families, something that Scarborough needs. But we also need the families that you've brought in to the rest of, of Easton Village. So where's the room? Is there room? Well, there, what you see right here is, uh, is done with the least amount of wetland impact. We really can't move buildings in any direction without impacting wetlands. What you don't have the benefit of right there with that plan is having that shaded in. But essentially, wetlands are all around those areas. We, it took a while to build a plan together that could work without impacting the wetlands to a large degree. You can't move buildings. Did we pull up the architectural binder? The second sheet, I believe. Should be shaded. There we go. So, yeah, so you can see at the ward end side of the street, it, it's wetlands right now, so there's really not a lot to fit in for building and parking on that end. We've, that at some length early on. We went through multiple iterations before we brought this plan to the September 2018 neighborhood meeting. So essentially, uh, without, there's no way to slide the apartments towards Ward Street. I, I'm using the term slide because I'm just thinking other shifts possible. What you're saying is the impact on the wetlands uh, would be extensive uh, it, and if, how if much you, would the difference in distance be? If you look right now, the parking lot is essentially up against the wetland that's closest to, to uh, Ward Street and there's no room on the other side. And we had to put the road where we put it so we didn't go and impact wetlands further. All right, let's, uh, let's take a look at um, another potential uh, adjustment. And I'm looking at the parking lots for that 12-unit building, the parking area closest to Ballantyne. If you eliminate the four spaces closest to uh, Camden, thus creating more room for buffering, is that possible? I guess I don't understand exactly where you're where you're talking about. 
right there. Yeah, right that's, there. That's, that's the spot. It's the parking area closest. Well, well, you have to meet a certain parking standard. I don't, I don't see where we would add the parking that we would have to include by taking those spaces away. And spaces on lot, I don't know, it looks like 138, um, the parking in back of, parking area in back of that, it's not possible to eliminate, looks like two spaces to create more of a buffering area. It's the parking space, that parking lot right across the street. Right there. The back of 138, yeah, that one. Okay, uh, but we have to add it somewhere else. Um, you can only go so far in a northeast direction without getting you know, close to that building over there. If we're talking about taking two parking spaces down there and pushing it over to the other side, okay. I, sure, I, I, I'd be willing to do that, but that's, you know. I, I, my sense is every foot is important in a sense, because of the proximity of these apartments, the size of them, the height, uh, and the, basically the space and bulk standards. So two feet, three feet, four feet allows more buffering, allows another tree to go in, allows some more landscaping. And that's, that's a, I'm just interested in exploring some of the, the possibilities to see if there are ways that the concerns of the neighbors and your concerns about how you're developing that can find a place where they meet. Uh, well, let me just point out also that these buildings are within the allowable height and I believe are under three feet taller than the townhouse buildings in Eastern Village. So even though they may be more stories, they're not much taller. They're only taller by like less than three feet. But if your question is, can I add those two parking spaces on the other side of that first parking lot as you go into the left, closer to the building, by pulling two of the parking spaces away from 138, 139, I suppose if the geometrics work, we could do that. And, and add buffering, add more landscaping? Well, we already have two rows of, uh, we, have a, we have two, we have offset trees going through there. What are, we, what are we talking about? Are you talking about me adding another two or three pine trees in there, or what are we talking about? Uh, I, since I'm not a landscape architect, I don't want to talk about that. The, but, but I do see some space possibilities there where additional trees can be added um, at the uh, using the expertise of the landscape architect to just plain add some additional buffering there because now there's a slightly more space. Um, that still does not address uh, the issue of the, the lot closest. Um, and I'm at a loss because I, I understand your, your issues and concerns. I'm at a loss at what to suggest and well, I was hoping me, you would have a, you, you might have some options we could look at. Well, one thing I can tell you is that parking lot, when you, the first one on the right, when you pull into Camden Street, that parking lot used to go closer to those four lots around Ballantyne and based on some of the comments, we moved it, we rotated it counterclockwise to take that into account. So what you see now has already been made, a change has been made to address that concern. Okay. Um, well, I, that's, I guess I'm kind of at the end of what I can think of as options there, but I, I hope you'll consider to, you know, think about, you're, you're, a, you're a very smart person uh, in terms of these developments and how things work. and. It would be helpful if you just continue to think about some of the issues around that particular issue that that have been raised here. Uh, I've got uh, another question, um, and that is I'm looking at what you're calling, see if I can find it, uh, a 70-foot long 
um, modular block retaining wall. And it says designed to be determined that goes along uh, Camden Road. Uh, when are we going to see that design? How that, how that was tall? eliminated per, per DEP uh, requirements that DEP wanted us to do. Those have been eliminated. There will be no retaining walls. The site was lowered. There were things that were done to essentially make DEP happy. And Okay. All right. Um, I'm looking now at the dog park and the area of the dog park, and I would make a suggestion uh, in terms of some placemaking that you might consider putting in a couple of benches for the people to sit while their dogs are in the park. Okay. I would assume... I'm, I'm going to actually ask you what may be a very basic and stupid question. Are these apartments or are they condos? I see them referred to as both. So they will be rented out, but they will be uh, built in uh, a way that they could be sold as condominiums at some point in the future, potentially. All right, but 10 they years, 15 years. But they are starting off as apartments. Yes, absolutely. And the... Um, the organization that will take care of them is the Homeowners Association of Eastern Village? No, North Village. If nobody owns it, if these are apartments. I own it. Okay, so, the way that so you're responsible for taking care. Okay. Yes, that, I'm sorry. That, the document that was submitted to Jay outlined all that. It said North Village, and it runs with the land. So if there's any ownership change, those responsibilities fall on to the next uh, owner. All right. Um, I then would request that I haven't had a chance to look at the uh, uh, what you submitted, but I do know we've had in the past questions about dog waste. It is a hazardous waste. Uh, it is very important that uh, cleanliness be maintained. I know there are other apartments that what they do is when a tenant comes on uh, with a with an animal, um, they actually have to do a genetic or DNA testing, and if there's a lot of waste around, some of that waste is tested, and if it's determined that a particular dog and its owners are responsible for waste in the streets, that those owners are fined per the homeowners association. Uh, so that might be a way to encourage people to uh, pick up a little more. Um, we but I do suggest that you put a couple of benches at the around the dog park uh, so that folks can sit. And in other places, if there's a potential for that sort of placemaking with benches, that would be very helpful. You've, you've got a good indoor opportunity with the community center uh, and the outdoor opportunity for people with dogs. Um, but for other folks who want to stroll along the streets, uh, a place to sit and look at the architecture, look at the trees, and just rest and enjoy the, the village there would be very helpful. Uh, I know there are some questions around the issue of um, Ward Street, just to put a, my two cents worth on that. Uh, I, I agree that that needs to be finished pretty fast, simply because of the amount of traffic um, on Ballantyne and creating as soon as possible that extra exit from Eastern Village. Um, I think that's important and I think it's important that a sidewalk run the length of it. I'm pleased to hear that the town is willing to discuss that with you, uh, what that might look like. I think that's a positive step forward, uh, but there very definitely needs to be a sidewalk there all the way up Ward Street. However, it's determined whoever is going to pay for it. But I think we, we sure, certainly do need that. And I have no more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. So before I turn it over to my colleague, I just want to make note, Carrie, you don't have a stormwater plan submitted with this, do you? Well, we, DEP reviewed the project, reviewed the stormwater plan, gave us a DEP permit. They won't, Steve can talk to this, but they reviewed stormwater. 
they gave us a permit based on what they received if we haven't submitted to you a grading plan i mean i think we believe it's a little bit de minimis given that the site came down a little bit but none of the slopes or inverts changed the porous pavement uh that's all stayed the same uh but i have no problem submitting something as a condition but dep has we were in dep for nine months Right. We went we through still, a thorough yeah, review. We still have not had local review of the stormwater uh, submission, correct? I don't believe that's true, no. I mean, the, the DEP reviews stormwater. We have local. I mean, Steve can speak to this, but it's my understanding we that also, DEP has jurisdiction over stormwater. Jay will fill us in on this one. But sure, typically, be, and, you know, typically projects that require DEP permit also get local review. Um, this board has in the ordinance, one of your uh, applicability standards is, does it meet sort of quality and, quali uh, quality and quantity standards of stormwater? Um, and certainly DEP is a component to that review. Um, but I think as we've talked about on this board a number of times, there's often local issues that DEP doesn't sort of keep its eye on. Um, so typically this board does look to have our peer reviewer and our town engineer sign off on uh, stormwater plans. Um, I think I, I was able and I, you know, we, we do have a copy of their DEP permit. Um, I think it references changes as uh, recently as January 14th or 16th. Um, and again, we haven't seen those plans. So, um. so, so storm, the stormwater plans do need to be submitted to this town. Uh, at least in my opinion, my board here could disagree with me, but I, I tend to agree with staff that local review is important in this instance. You also do not have, uh, you know, per, per Bill Bray, who is your own traffic engineer, uh, you know, said that you need to complete a safety assessment uh, through the intersections at Eastern Village. Uh, we don't have that. We don't have the safety report with the data driver, and we uh, do want to have the, um, you do want to have a main DOT letter citing that you don't need a modification for the TMP. So missing that, you're missing a lighting plan. So what, what I want to kind of slow you down on before we get too far into board discussion is whether or not you'll be receiving any type of conditional approvals this evening. As far as I'm concerned personally, I won't be making any motions as such. My board members are completely free to do so, um, but I want you to keep that in mind that this in my mind and in, from what I could tell from staff, this does not appear to reach where we need to be to even begin to talk about conditional approval of any sort. All right. Roger, would you like to go? Actually, I just yeah. want to make one sure. point of clarification. I believe you indicated that uh, Bill Bray was the applicant's traffic engineer. Actually, Bill Bray is working, is the yes. peer reviewer. Goral Palmer, Randy Dunton is the applicant's peer review engineer. Uh, I'm sorry, traffic engineer. And Thank if, you. if I may, on that point, I, I would like just to ask the question. Um, it was referenced about how there was a um, maybe that the applicant and staff read um, the requirement for or the, the, the suggestion that the um, MDOT weigh in on whether a modification is required or not. That was actually stated in a September memo from Randy Dunton. So that, that's where that concept generated from that it was his suggestion that DOT be asked to weigh in on if the modifications are required. So um, it's it's a plain statement. So um, and I can bring it up, but I don't believe there was a misread there it was what their traffic engineer suggested be done. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate it. Roger. Okay. <clears throat> um. You know, it's been, it's been interesting listening to the comments and, and your comments, Carrie, to try and justify everything. Uh, I just have, um, I have some questions for you. Um, when I'm looking at, first of all, I want to say, I think generally Eastern Village, the re regular Eastern Village looks great. I think it really looks nice architecturally and everything. I think people, are, based on what happened at South Village, they're, you know, kind of gun shy about what might happen here. Um, I think architecturally what you have here looks, it's quite a bit of an improvement over what you had in the, in the other uh, section. Um, I'm just wondering though, because what I'm hearing, how difficult would it be, for instance, for you to switch the phasing like some of the residents have talked about? 
it would be terms, very difficult. In terms of the construction. It would be very difficult. We, um, you know, the site's ready to come in off Ballantyne much easier. Um, we have our shop up there with all our tools that uh, we need to essentially build most of this project from. It'd be very difficult. But it could be done, though, right? Yeah. Um, the, um, I, I think Ward Street's a, a big question here. Um, how long? How long is Ward Street from uh, Route One? to his property, do we, do we know that? I did a, um, a, a quick measurement on the, on the GIS, um, so I take that for the accuracy that it is. It was roughly eight to 900 feet, somewhere in that order of magnitude. Okay. Um, does, this, does this, based on what you've seen, Jay, is this, that section of Watt Street where there's people living there now, is that gonna really create some problems trying to bring that into compliance with you know the um, fitting into this this section of the street here uh, I don't know that we have the level of detail to say one way or the other um, I, I do believe it was at the at the prior September meeting that the board had asked the applicant to look at it and um, it sounds like they've done some initial exploration but I haven't seen any details that, so I, I really can't speak to that. Okay, assuming that you continue on with your phasing the way you want to do it, um, if Ward Street were to be solved, would people who are moving in to say, um, is it building 17, is that what I saw? 17, the first one nearest Valentine, would they be able to drive all the way up through or would there be construction prohibiting them from actually driving up through that way? They wouldn't be able to connect onto Ward Street, you mean? Right. Yeah, they wouldn't be able to connect up onto Ward Street until essentially the last building gets under construction closest okay. to Ward Street. Okay, so basically all these buildings nearest Ballantyne, as, as they're being developed, built, people are going to have to go back out onto Ballantyne. To That's get correct. I don't know. I, I I think that's you know. I understand what you're saying. You all you can. I don't know what your construction stuff consists of, but it seems like that would alleviate a lot of the problems if you could just flip that around. Um, the other thing is, I'm looking at. Is, it is building 17, right? It's, seven, oh, seven, okay. seven. Okay, seven. Um, in your business plan. <laughs> what, what would happen if you didn't you did you know you just eliminated building seven completely a building seven eliminate it you mean don't build it correct it has an enormous impact financially this project has to be feasible to do so so basically you're saying it has to be there to make it economically feasible too. What you see, yes. The, um, then, then the, other, the other thing I think you have to do then is maybe, assuming everything goes the way it is, because I'm not, you know, I think you have to have some more robust buffering right down there by that building, by the parking lot, the parking spaces between those homes right there. Um, and I agree with one of the other, you know, some of the speakers, when you're, when you're talking about trees that are gonna be losing their leaves and everything during the winter, you need to have, I think you, you should have some more robust buffering right there, especially taller. And um, one, one place I often think about when we talk about buffering is on Pleasant Hill Road, the uh, commercial paving. You know how they, when they built that, they put a berm then they put white pines and they stagger the white pines. I mean, that's, that's a real good buffer right there. And um, I don't know if anything like that makes sense because somebody made the comment about putting trees in this area that may not survive. Um, are you confident whatever you're putting in there, they're gonna survive? Well, we'd have the responsibility of putting them in and making sure that they survive, yeah. yeah. But I would, I would suggest uh, or recommend you really consider some more, you know, robust buffering right there around those parking lots, right behind those those single-family homes. 
assuming that this is going to go the way it's going to go now the 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 community center is strictly for the north village residents what's i'm sorry the community center it's strictly for north village that's correct but the dog park anybody in the, the whole area could use that is that correct uh yeah i mean we don't have a problem with people from eastern village or south village use it we will be uh you know we work in they're going to need to pick up after their dog yeah we disagree with the comment that's been made about people aren't picking up after their dog and that all comes from south village i mean we're we're on that we make sure that that doesn't happen uh, it's a big issue with us so uh, is do you feel the dog is it is the dog park going to be large enough I mean, I believe it is. Yeah. Are there dimensions based on how many people you have <laughs> that determines the size of a dog park? Um, no, I mean, I believe it is. And, um, you know, as you can see, there's not a lot of room to expand it. I mean, we we're, got a lot of wetlands around there, mm -hmm. you know, so. Um, the last thing I'll ask you, uh, Carrie, is about the, um, the phasing that's been brought up. It, it always comes up. Um, is there any reason, uh, can you explain, i got to find out where it is now, uh, is it phase six and seven, like the lady, is it six and seven, um, all the yellow, the yellow you had on the map, I assume is all developed, but down close to the eastern, eastern trail, that's not developed yet, is that correct? Right. Okay. Is there, can you explain why you're not finishing off that, so all these other areas can get everything can be wrapped up everything is completed down there except for some trees that we're holding off on until we test the soil which the university of maine has the soils right now and we're waiting for a report back on that but other than that towns asked us to hold off on final pavement there's we're under construction in phase five we still have to put the sidewalk around there there's houses being built south village's uh infrastructure is complete landscaping's complete we still have to put some fencing in but only around a few things i mean it's it's 97 percent complete of what we have to do right now we can't really do too much more on the south village uh, i actually drove through the place again the other day um primarily to look at the colors because i mentioned to you about the colors on the buildings before and uh, but i noticed driving into south village the ut utilities on the outside of the building do you are those going to be enclosed eventually they are enclosed just the other day they were all exposed you mean the heat pumps heat pumps yeah we're going to put a fence in front of those but the electrical boxes are enclosed they're all enclosed they've been enclosed for months okay so so the uh, heat pumps will be enclosed no okay. there's going to be a fence that goes in front of those oh, okay so you won't see them basically when you're driving you, I mean, you can't completely close them in. They have to move air in and out, but they will be uh, hidden better. Okay. Just, just in closing, I'm going to make another pitch for the colors, okay? Because um, I, I do believe, and, and I know you feel very passionately about these federal-style buildings, um, but I, I, the thing that struck me when I drove through the other day is almost, including the townhouses, they're all color they, they have different shades of you know gray and light greens and reds and things like that they I think they look very attractive but the the white like apartments they really stand out because they're besides being big white just makes things appear larger you know and I I think if you could somehow bring yourself to think about some colors <laughs> you know mix some colors into these these units I think that would make them look more attractive and by the way, I, when I drove through there, and I'm sure there may be more, but I only saw, I think, two or three white buildings. Almost all, all the buildings are single-family homes, including the townhouses were of some color. So I just... Uh, there's nine townhouses that are white. Uh, all in one stretch? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, we're trying to follow a main vernacular, a uh, white building with red roof. Portland headlight, it doesn't get any more vernacular than that, but we can take a look at it. Okay. I'm done. <laughs> Thanks, Roger. Jen. 
Um, <clears throat> question for Jay, actually. Do you, does the town have any um, near-term plans for any other improvements on Ward Street and or at the intersection of Ward and Route 1, the signal or anything around there? I have not heard from our Public Works Department where Ward Street fits in their sort of pavement replacement uh, projects at this point. Um, I'm not aware of any. Certainly there's been, this project's been talked about and that hasn't come up, so. Sure, okay. Um, I guess without, you know, belaboring the point, I would just voice support for our peer reviewers comment and staff comments about providing pedestrian connection between this neighborhood and Route 1 on Ward Street and I think that um, doing that in a continuous way is should be preferable to anything with a mid-block crossing on Ward Street. Um, I know that was mentioned in one of the in one of the comments. Um, but I'm glad to hear that maybe there's an opportunity for continuing to talk through that um, with staff. Um, I also just kind of have a little bit hard time uh, with, the, with the phasing of the project in that you'll be funneling both construction traffic and any resident traffic as people move into these buildings through um, Valentine Drive and Eastern Village where you know, we've heard comments from a number of residents about different traffic concerns, um, and then, and or through the Eastern Road intersection with Black Point Road, which um, was also discussed in some of the review um, material as either being a high crash location or being very close to a high crash location. Um, and the fact that there's a signal at the end of Ward Street just sort of makes this, an, you know, in my opinion, an obvious um, remedy for a lot of that. Um, I'm curious whether or not, so you mentioned, Roger asked specifically about access through Ward Street. Um, I'm just curious if you have any intent to use that during construction for any construction traffic or staff traffic or anything like that, or, or how you envision not allowing that, I guess. I'm not sure I understand. So if you're building a road, um, if you're working on, you know, the construction of Camden Street and you have dump trucks hauling in base material or whatever, are they coming from Ward Street and coming in that way, or are they coming through Valentine Drive? Both. Both. Okay. So there will be construction traffic, um, but not resident traffic. So if it's physically possible for a construction vehicle to get through, how are you, um, what's your thought about keeping that closed for residents? Well, there's some resident trap or some construction trap that's going to go through Ward Street that's going to be materials that, um, you know, you need to place for pipe, roads and whatnot that's not necessarily accessible. You know, material will be dropped. It'll be pushed with a bulldozer and whatnot. Ballantine, because it's going to be near impossible to keep it just in one area, and residents for materials like wood, contractors and whatnot, tradesmen, and then obviously uh, people living in there also using Ballantine. Okay. Um, I, I, I just think that getting that open as quickly as possible would be a benefit both to your construction operations and to the people that already live in these neighborhoods and that you hope to attract to the um, to these residences. Um, and then I think other than things that have been mentioned, oh, actually, I do have a couple of specific comments. Um, I was curious, so in your, um, in the letter that was submitted with this application, you made reference to uh, work being proposed improvements on Bessie Square Pond to be done in the winter time, and I was just curious if those have been completed yet or not. Those are going to be started probably in the next 30 days. Okay. And the there was a response um, question about sheet three 
point one, the site plan making reference to a 13, 13th Amendment. Um, this, the copy that I have references a 13th Amendment, but the response to comment says that it had been revised to reference the 14th Amendment. So I'm not sure if that's still an outstanding comment or not, at least on the version that I have, it appears that it would still be outstanding. Um, I know that's just a word edit, but. Um, and then lastly, if you are to come forth again with a lighting plan, um, there was a comment made previously about whether or not you would consider dimming the lights on this site at, some, at any point or at some point, um, to which no response was given. So. I would just be interested to know if that's something that could be incorporated into the future lighting plan. Um, and lastly, with regard to the grading and drainage plan, I do just think it's a little curious that you would have, I guess if you've submitted a plan that was worked through extensively from what it sounds like um, and then approved by DEP, why not just submit it to the planning board? That would be a question for my engineer. I do believe the lighting plan was submitted, though, Mr. Chairman. I saw in the submittal basically the town fixture, and on the plan it shows where the lights are. There wasn't a photometric plan submitted, but there was a lighting plan submitted. Excuse me. I, I, I think some of the reference might be about lighting within the parking lot. Typically, you know, the, the town fixtures are what we see in the right of way, um, and folks sometimes use that in the parking lots or on buildings. And I think that's maybe more the reference about the photometrics plan. That was our, 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 uh, in our submission, we made, not, we made mention of that. We said that we were using the same light in the uh, parking areas. And as far as your comment about uh, dimmers and timers and whatnot, those lights are, they have a uh, photomet, uh, they have an eye at the top of them. So they come on and off by the darkness. So that was our, I mean, we didn't say it, I guess, but that was our response to that. I, I think I just interpreted the comment to be an additional dimming. I know sometimes on other sites we've talked about um, the option for dimming after, say, for example, after significant business operations somewhere have ended for the evening, and um, especially in a residential area like this, just, just um, consideration to the other neighbors in this area, and I apologize in saying lighting plan, I was in my head I was picturing photometric plan, which would kind of help us understand some of those points a little bit. Understand. So, thanks. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Rick DePerry. It was. Yes. So what we were asked to do is uh, we were asked to do traffic counts, which we did, and those, uh, those areas were counted. Um, and it showed, after it was all said and done, my understanding is once North Village is built and phases five, excuse me, phases six and seven, so essentially full build out, that there would be an additional seven trips in the PM 41 in the a.m. But until the rest of the phases of, of Eastern Village are built, North Village doesn't trigger that. That's why I think that there's maybe a little bit of misunderstanding in terms of that. Zero percent, it's raw land. There's no infrastructure. So I guess if that's the case, I don't understand why we're going to phase eight. Then. You're saying this is phase eight, right? Right. So you're skipping six and seven, you're going to go on to eight? Well, I think this gets back to, you know, do you need to do things in a chronological order? And I can tell you, I can't think right now when I've had a project that's been as multi-phase as this if we've changed phasing, but I can tell you that South Village was originally phase eight, and it's built, and this was phase nine. 
and we changed the phasing because we were asked to, but again, that brings up a lot of other things that down the line have to be changed with other agencies. In talking with the engineer, it's not uncommon to develop a phase that's, I mean, when you go and you put phasing on a plan, it's your best guess. It could change. You, you could start at phase three or phase eight or phase two. It doesn't say you have to be one, two, three. It doesn't have to go in lockstep. Um, so, um, you know, phase six and seven are further into the project down by Eastern Road. We're building out phase five now. We just developed phase 5A. Uh, we're not going to get to phase six and seven until obviously we sell out the remaining lots in phase five and phase 5A. Hey, Rick, uh, Jay wanted to quickly supplement. Yeah, just because there have been a lot of questions about the phasing plan that um, certainly staff has received from residents, and I think we've had this sort of conversation in the past as well around sort of what the phasing plan sort of is and the sort of as, as uh, uh, Mr. Anderson was just talking about sort of the sequential nature or not of it and how that all works. And, and I guess, you know, from, from the town's perspective, the phasing plan that we have for Eastern Village um, really, I think, as uh, Mr. Anderson was just describing, identifies areas of improvement. And really, those for the town are identifying areas where performance guarantees are required before development, before dirt starts moving within those boundaries. The numbers themselves, you know, aren't necessarily se sequential at this point because the plan board hasn't put any further conditions on the phasing plan. And so, um, at this point, the town's holding performance guarantees for all the open phases, and there are sort of very, they're at different stages, I think, as Mr. Anderson's uh, talked about. You know, some phases are just getting started, like phase five or 5A. Um, other phases are much further along, and there are certain elements that aren't complete. Um, I know we've talked in the past and if, and with this board about there being earlier phases where maybe it doesn't make sense right now to do the top coat of pavement because we know there's going to be further construction. So, um, uh, I guess I, you know, just want to echo what Mr. Anderson was saying, and, and I think where the conversation was going was, you know, at this point, the, the phasing plan and the numbers aren't necessarily what's the key component. Um, I will, but I will sort of uh, come back to the one of the things I said at the at the early um, at the outset of this conversation is one one of the conditions that the board did put on the phasing plan is that. Um, or, or on the subdivision, the overall subdivision, is that prior to start of phase seven, that there be sort of a, a traffic analysis, a further traffic analysis done to sort of see where we're at. Um, and I, I think Mr. Mr. Anderson sort of alluded that, to that as well as to how far, because we know traffic studies are their, their best estimate, right? We, but we don't actually know how people are going to, to move through a neighborhood. Um, so I guess the question at that time when, when that, in, in phase seven, quite frankly, is the furthest sort of remote. <laughs> so though, as I said before, it doesn't have to go sequentially, the, all the infrastructure that would need to be built to get to phase seven would sort of pretty clearly indicate that that would happen, but it may not have. But anyway, uh, that aside, I think the question, one of the questions we have now is with, you know, that was a 16 unit, 16 single family units, is now with the introduction of this additional phase, you know, do we want to relook at that condition, or do we are we still really concerned with just the start of that sort of remote single-family pocket before we start the traffic impact study? And so I think those are some of the complex questions that we still need to uh, uh, want to work through with the applicant, and maybe even I think it's suggested in in the comments is having a sit down with with his traffic engineer and and town staff and our peer review traffic engineer might be helpful to understand and get, get sort of at the crux of some of these questions so we can come back with uh, fuller answers for the board. Thanks, Jay. Rick. Okay, thank you. That was a good explanation. And my concern wasn't necessarily how you do the, um, how you do the phases. I understand that's, you're doing them whatever, how, the way it makes sense. Um, I was more 
getting to the fact that some of the some of the letters that we received and some of the, the feedback from the public was that um, some things weren't completed and I guess I was in my mind I thought maybe six and seven had been started but not completed but it more, sounds more like they haven't even been started it's just raw land yeah so let me just uh, tell the board right now phases one and two have been completed phase three and four it does not have surface pavement on it because the town has asked us to hold off they the only remaining item in those two phases is street trees and there's uh, something going on with the soil down there we were asked to look at the soil get it tested a uh, bunch of samples were sent up to the university of maine obviously we don't want to put in trees if there's a problem the trees are dying uh, and then phase five uh, has uh, been, uh, was started earlier, uh, you know, May of last year. Uh, but base pavement is down. They're building houses out there. Um, that's it. I mean, there's, there's not stuff left undone all over the place as it's been alluded to. It's absolutely incorrect. Okay. All right. Um, and just a last note on phasing. I do know from a utility aspect they hate it when you change phases because it's um, we're kind of they kind of plan on. Do you work for CMP? Yeah, <laughs> I do the 905s. There you go. See, you um, can attest. Um, so then, just on sidewalks, I saw that you you know you have to put in the ten thousand dollars to help with the sidewalks, mm -hmm. and I'm, I wish Angela was here. I think at one time she quoted me or quoted in one of these meetings, a price per foot for sidewalk, a rough price per foot. And I guess I'm gonna ask you and Jay at the same time, was the expectation that the developer would pay for the sidewalks incomplete? Because that's the way it looks from like the peer reviews, but I'm yeah, not sure if I'm uh, reading it right. I guess what I would say staff comments have been and continue to be in our memo that we believe based on the uh, expectation of the zoning ordinance that it's a requirement of the development. It says it in the TD, TND that the expectation is that the sidewalks be built to abutting, um, uh, to abutting amenities. It does say we're practical. So that's a question to the board. I, um, I do know I did have an opportunity to, um, you know, as staff, we review all applications. And um, I think the feeling was $10,000 was probably a very low number for what would be required for the work. But again, I think that's another piece where I think additional uh, discussion um, may be warranted. Right. And that makes sense. And I think that additional discussion um, is, is one of the one of the things that needs to be figured out uh, be in advance of approval, you know what I mean? So, um, and then uh, a lot, we talked about this Ward Street connection a lot. And let me ask you this, um, Carrie. So I, in, in the notes that I saw, it, it appears that all these buildings are gonna be kind of built in parallel, which makes sense, right? You're gonna do a foundation, uh, you're gonna dig a, you can excavate, 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 foundation, 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 and do it in parallel, depending on whatever resources you can get, right? So if you can get enough foundation guys, you'll do all the foundations at once. If you can't, you'll just move down the line. I'm just thinking I, that's the way. So I, I, that Wall Street connector, I think you said, is a, is a real hard thing for you to do while you're doing this construction, and that makes sense. But how soon after the construction is done, can that Ward Street connector be completed? So all we consider foundations ground contact. So all ground contact work will be done as quickly as possible. And it's essentially framing, which takes longer to be done. You right. got obviously all the various trades inside and, and whatnot. But what we had said was that we would commit to before the last building, which would be under construction as soon as possible, as soon as we get to it, foundation again yeah. right away and yeah. on and on that we would commit to before a CO was uh, requested for that building that we would have that connection made it's really because our okay. shop is right in the middle yeah, of no, that I'm, road coming in I'm familiar so with, it's all about I've been through there a bunch of times I'm, I understand exactly right. what you're saying so but if so if their certificate of occupancy for that build last building was um, to contingent upon that Ward Street connector being done that wouldn't be an issue for you not at all so that might be I mean it sounds like you've already 
said that that's fine. So yeah. I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't misunderstanding. No, we, we fully intend to do it. We just need to try and <clears throat> work out of our shop in the area where we have all our equipment and structures and pipe and everything else up there as long as we can. Okay. And then I think the last thing on my, on my list was, um, well, I think everybody else has talked about buffering, so I'm not going to. It is kind of, someone did make a point about the trees not losing their leaves in the wintertime, and I hadn't really thought about that. So I guess that kind of lends itself to fir trees and pine trees being a good choice. But I don't have a problem swapping out the deciduous with conifers. That's no issue. We just thought that there should be something <clears throat> for all seasons. Um, I really don't support berms. They're a, uh, they're a, um, don't support them at all, really. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I just, I had a question about, I, I like, I actually like the design of that building a lot. It kind of reminds me of a, from, from, it, I think it goes, seems to fit with the, some of the other houses that are in the neighborhood. But are those chimneys real? Are those going to be functional? Is that, is it gas heat, electric heat, oil heat? I'm that's an existing building that's built. It's a townhouse. They, what we're building in North Village will not be those. And those are, they do function uh, for gas, but they don't function for anything other than gas. Oh, I thought that rendering we had had the chimneys. So We gave those as a uh, kind of a uh, reference for um, scale and uh, height okay. and whatnot. Okay. <clears throat> All right, I guess I was looking at that, and I didn't notice on this. The, the, okay. Um, I kind of like the chimneys, but I understand they're, they're a lot of work. So that's all I have. Thanks, Rick. Thanks. Rick Mikey. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, and we've been on this subject for quite a bit, so I'll try to be brief. <clears throat> Kerry, are you going to put power to the garages and the storage rooms? Yes. So is there an opportunity to maybe in a couple of these put an EV charger in for those that uh, will be purchasing and operating an electric vehicle? Yes. That'd be excellent. Uh, the town's trying to work its way f with the sustainability and, and these kind of issues. Um, on the buildings themselves, you mentioned uh, heat pumps. Are the line sets going interior, or are they going to be exposed on the on the outside? Interior. Okay, that's great. Um, I would like to see a photometrics to include the different lights that are on these outhouse outbuildings. Uh, notice on some of the elevation profiles, you did have down lights on the post office and the recycling tra trash but I also would like to see them on the garages. And then my final comment goes back to the very original coming in off of uh, Valentine Drive, that building number seven. Would it be a financial hardship to make that an eightplex instead of a 12plex and lower it to one, lower it by one story? You could eliminate a couple of parking spots and uh, maybe that will bid some goodwill. <coughs> I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can't begin to tell you how expensive this project is. Um, we're paying $419,000 impact fees to the town. We're talking about sidewalks going up Ward Street. We've got a wetland impact of uh, 63000 We've got porous pavement on all the parking lots to make stormwater happy to the tune of about 500,000. I mean, we just, <laughs> project just can't absorb it. I hate to say it. If we didn't have a million dollars in all these other costs that aren't attributable building buildings, then I could consider it. But given that to be the case, I just don't see it. Well, I think some of the way, uh, the storm water is due to the wetlands and all of that, and that's part of the the, the profile of the, the the lot, the land. I mean, I, I understand you have to work around that. Um, you know, the porous that's going to help the stain uh, the storm water. Sure, um, without it, it would be worse. Um, I just think maybe there's a way that uh, these abutters. Uh, would not have to uh, 
look out of their second story window and see you know a, a big building right in their backyard something to consider um I'd like to at least entertain that thought and i'd be remiss if i didn't bring it up okay. thank you rick appreciate it um so i'm gonna try to tie this all together first first i want to address all the people that came here tonight i um there's a couple things I want to want the audience at home and the people here to understand is that um, when we approve a plan, it's not necessarily the shovel in the ground. Um, it's for possible future development um, based on these plan sets. So the board really does have uh, some ability to make some conditional approvals uh, before a shovel does hit the ground. So I'd, I'd like you to keep that in mind as we look at these plans. Um, the applicants typically need the time that the lead time to get uh, whether it's financing or workers or whatever it might be, hands and materials, they, they do need time. Uh, and then some of the feedback that we heard from the audience this evening, you know, I felt felt that some of it seemed to be um, homeowner association related or rules enforcement associated. If we get into dog waste, um, I'd hate to to think that we can hold a developer responsible for owners not being responsible with their pets. And uh, so I would encourage you, uh, while it is this, an issue, um, and this is coming from a, a, a person who owns a property management company, so I'm very familiar with dog waste issues, um, that you look towards your homeowners association to be better at enforcing um, those types of rules. The, the other thing to keep in mind, this is a high density project. This was approved, how many years ago, Carrie? Uh, the the master, master plan is oh, 13 years 2005 old. 2005 for the master plan. 2005, so 15 years. Uh, we have a master plan uh, for a very high density project. And I know that predates everyone on this board and it predates all of you living there. Um, it's, it's one of those things you have to understand that when you're buying into something especially if it's not fully built out, you can see projects like this come through. And for us as planning board members, our job here is to make sure that we uphold the ordinances of this town, that is complying with the ordinances as he goes through it. Um, so it, that said, um, I also can't thank you enough for the feedback that you've provided us uh, during this process. It really helps sharpen some of our comments, uh, some of the items that um, are brought to our attention that often may be overlooked because we're not living on site. So um, having you here too is is a blessing, and I do greatly appreciate all that feedback. Um, so that said, we as a board have some work to do, and I'm going to do my best to summarize so uh, and bring some clarity for Kerry as he goes back and reviews these plans. Um, so. Uh, the board needs to first answer uh, really three big questions before I'll make my recommendations. We have two waiver requests, one of them being a 90-foot separation between driveways. Uh, I didn't hear anyone weigh, weigh in on whether or not they found uh, the request for the waiver appropriate or whether or not the 90-foot separation between driveways uh, in that area should be enforced. So um, I could get a quick feedback from the board. Uh, just maybe a quick straw poll of show of hands. Who is okay with this waiver request? Okay. So I show that waiver request as okay by the board. The second waiver request is we have a parking lot aisle width of 25 feet instead of 22 feet. Uh, 22 feet, as uh, the applicant has maintained, is the current roadway width, and I believe is it the other standard you're using throughout the rest of the development? Is that accurate? Um, for mm -hmm. Yes, uh, well, I think twofold. Yes, that, and the fact that the, uh, the TND calls for a 20-foot curb-to-curb section. Uh, early on in this project, the uh, staff asked, town staff, uh, planning staff asked us to consider widening that out to 22 feet, which we did. It's our feeling that the aisle, if cars can pass uh, in a 22-foot section, and certainly driving slowly in a parking aisle is easy enough to do. Sure. Thank you, I appreciate that. And uh, for what it's worth, um, we did have comment from, from the owners here saying that some of those parking lots out there are a bit tight if you drive a larger vehicle or have a, a tow truck that may need to get in. 
have any thoughts? Is that maybe based on existing drive aisles that might be narrower than what this is, or is this the first time it's going to be expanded to that 22 on, on the project? The, uh, well, I don't know as we have an aisle width. Uh, I don't know what the aisle width over in South Village is. If that's what you're asking me. I, I understand what you're saying is that the, uh, the 25 feet is required. I guess I would also say that back when we got Eastern Village approved, we got uh, geometrics changed to align with what we were trying to do. Maybe we didn't talk about aisle width in particular, but uh, it's my opinion that uh, that's just in keeping with what we're already doing down to Eastern Village. And um, I understand what you're saying about tow trucks and things along those lines. I would just say that uh, we see cars as being better. The cars in South Village are the majority and the vast majority of them are small cars. Okay. We'd like to stay with the 22 feet. Mr. Chairman. So, so I need the board to weigh on whether, yes, Roger. I, I just want to ask Kerry, um, from the beginning when this total plan was first, you know, um, approved and everything, uh, what has changed is the delivery trucks, you know, like UPS and FedEx and things like that. Are you seeing any impact on, on those trucks going into the neighborhoods and creating any problems in, because of with the roads or anything like that? No. Okay. So I'd like the board to weigh in on whether or not uh, they're okay with the waiver request for a 22 foot wide drive aisle on the parkways, on the parking lots. All in favor of that waiver. Can I just get a quick show of it, Jen? I just have a comment, sorry. Um, I generally think the 22 foot aisle width is um, okay, but I'm curious about the depth of some of the turnarounds at the bottom end of the parking areas. Um, and just wondering if on future submissions they could either be dimensioned and potentially um, extended out a little bit. It looks like on the vast majority of them you actually have room to do so without impacting any wetlands, at least as, as far as the site plan um, is, is concerned. But I think a little bit deeper um, turnaround depth might uh, allow for better maneuverability in and out of the parking cells at the very end of those um, parking trace but okay. other than that the aisle width I think so we have a recommendation to um, leave the aisle width at 22 feet wide however with some additional work at the ends for a possible turnaround can do that. for ease of use for turnarounds is the board comfortable with that recommendation I see some nodding heads Rachel? no no I'm not I'm just concerned about um, how these parking lots will get narrower and narrower as as we get snow because it's going to be impossible to remove everything out of parking lots and if they start narrow um, with the snow even though there's the plowing some cars are going to be there they're going to be plowed in uh, and the whole area is going to be narrower so I actually prefer the 25. Thank you. Um, all right so that's uh, point um, 22 feet uh, Yes, Roger. Everything now is 22, is that correct? Uh, Throughout the whole site? The town width, the road of the, the road widths are 22. The road widths and the current design before you is 22 feet. I think what's been referenced uh, before is the existing uh, road network within Eastern Village, <coughs> excuse me, within Eastern Village is at 20 feet wide with sort of vertical curb, and I think that's been um, identified as a challenge by a number of the town departments as well as what we've heard from folks um, and so I think that was when the planning board started this process um, where you heard staff again uh, all the departments not just the planning department really sort of talking about thinking about what what might be a, uh, a, 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 a more practical design parameter uh, but still getting at the general intent of you know having a narrow road which does slow down traffic and those sorts of things so yeah can I make one comment about the uh, and I understand what you're saying I just want to say that we took great care in trying to find storage areas for the snow so that we could push the snow off the parking lots and not have snow piling up okay. so um, those in favor of a uh, the 
granting an applicant the waiver here for a 22 foot with some work done at the dead end. You see, just quick show of hands. Okay. All right. So, uh, last issue I really need the board to weigh in on before I make um, some further recommendations, which of course I'll ask for you to weigh in on as well, but uh, just clarity, uh, the sidewalk. Um, staff, I believe, has continued to recommend the developer build the sidewalk along Ward Street. I, I agree. I think this should be, it is part of the ordinance. It is part um, of what we feel like it should be the responsibility. Even if there was an in-lieu fee, I'm not 100% uh, certain the amount that's been offered up is adequate to uh, build that sidewalk. And I know, Carrie, you said that there are certain challenges in there with like uh, telephone poles and um, other, other issues out there before constructing it. But I would, I would prefer to see this as part of the project um, as required. Anyone else um, feel like an in-lieu fee is possible versus asking the developer to construct those sidewalks? Jen. Um, I agree that building that as part of the project would be appropriate, especially given the density here, and that it should be built first or very early in the project as opposed to at the end um, at, or full occupancy last uh, last CO for the building. And the reason for that is because I think that when you provide that type of amenity to residents that are coming in, um, if you have that at the outset, it helps. In, it, you know, you can offer that, first of all, as an amenity. And the proximity of this project to this municipal campus, the schools, public safety building, um, Oak Hill in general, I think is a really, is a really attractive uh, feature for, for this development. Um, but also it helps um, change, you know, change behavior. I don't know. So I would just like to see that. Can I respond to one thing on that? You may. Okay. So, um, and I think you can uh, appreciate what I'm about to say here. When you have telephone poles that are, that are in these areas, uh, it's, it's not, well, first off, you can't even get a hold of anybody uh, at Fairpoint anymore, or not even Fairpoint. Who is it now? Changes every year. Consolidated communication. We, we can't even reach those people. And a lot of the times, those poles are owned by the telephone company, even though the wires hanging on them are, are hung by Time Warner, CMP. The poles themselves are owned by the telephone companies. So what I'm saying is getting somebody to respond to moving those poles, working with us to find a location that's suitable for those poles could take months. And I just hate to see where we've got kind of the tail wagging, wagging the dog here. We're trying to get something in place and it, that's holding up a project when I don't dispute that, it, that it's merits, but the complications of it are one of the reasons why we made the contribution to the town and said, you guys have better, uh, you have more power in getting these things addressed than we certainly do. <clears throat> so... Um, the sidewalk in terms of when it gets built just needs, it just needs to be taken into account. It's not something that can be done 30, 60, 90 days from the day you determine you're going to do it because you have other people that are in the way that have to approve it. it, it, uh, it if I might just on that point, it, it, you know, depending on where the discussion with the board goes, certainly you know, thinking about the phasing plan and sort of identifying which amenities sort of happen at Think, ab think about, to, to Mr. Anderson's point, think about sort of a logical sequencing. Um, I think staff would be happy to, again, sort of work in, in the intermean, uh, intermeaning time to help Stealing think, thunder, think about that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Roger. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, I, I think it'd be easier for the town to be dealing with the, with the residents on that section of Ward Street than to ask the developer to try and you know, because they're going to be infringing on some of their their property, aren't they? Well, I, I think that's, that's a very narrow street to start with. I think that was part of the uh, um, question we had earlier. We haven't seen the details yet, so we don't know what the survey yeah. looks like. Um, but certainly, I think you're right. The town often has we we do have more ability to reach out to the folks who own poles and and get movement quicker than a private developer might. And uh, so, as I offer, mentioned before, I think. Um, the town managers are already offered to be part of the conversations and see um, where where we can leverage so um, the public's so I, involvement. I, I, I'm inclined to go with uh, you know some sort of fee in lieu of having 
the developer do this and have the town do it. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be it would get done probably quicker. Yeah, um, appreciate that. And for what it's worth, I also um, I also don't like the idea of placing the challenges of a development project um, onto the lap of the town to complete. Um, this that concerns me. So. I, I see it both ways. I know there's more pull behind the government calling than a provi private developer. However, I I'd also am not uncomfortable with just a developer saying, "I yeah, it's too hard. You guys do it." So, I'm not saying that's if I'm being flippant about it. No, I apologize, but um, I, I understand there's challenges on both sides of that. So, uh, what I do need though is I need this board to uh, one weigh in to some degree as to what the sidewalk looks like going forward. I'm okay with punting um, based on what my next comment's going to be, which is I, I feel, um, and I hope this board will support it, that we, uh, we asked Carrie to make a, a good faith effort to sit with our planning department, go over benchmarks for the completion of outstanding work and other phases that are reasonable to accomplish as a condition prior to starting work in this phase. Um, and I think Jay's alluded to some of this, which is the town has already said, you know, no top coat of asphalt in a couple of these spots because we know you're going to drag construction vehicles over it. Why, why, you know, and if it gets assigned to the town, why ruin some pavement? We don't want ruined pavement. So there are portions of these projects that are in phase and um, are, are being halted to an extent just so the practicality of it uh, makes sense for everyone. So. But I really think that it would serve you very well, both Carrie and the town and this planning board, to know that there's really been a sit down, hash it out, and see what what items and what phases can be wrapped up prior to beginning into a new phase. So that would be my my first recommendation. Part of that discussion can be the reasonableness of the sidewalk, whether that's part of the start of a plan, the end of the plan, if the town is doing it or the developer. And as uh, Jay has also just alluded to, it sounds like the town is willing to try to work with you on some of this to help move it along or become a partner and, and part of that. So um, I think a good faith meeting here about, I hate to call it a phasing plan because I know that triggers all sorts of other things, but there definitely should be a discussion of benchmark items that should be and need to be completed before a shovel goes in the ground over here. Or if a shovel goes in the ground here, we know before you get a CO on any of those then these items will be completed at some point. I'll Understood. leave that detailed work, time frames, benchmarks, to a, a honest and open discussion with staff. And I think I think that's a fair way to approach this. Does that sound fair, Carrie? Yes. Okay. Um, I think I don't want you know I don't want to get too far into it, but I think the traffic is going to have to be part of that discussion. And, and I'm not 100% solid on how it all works, but it sounds to me like had those other two phases that numerically come before this one, if they were built out, you might have actually been triggered to do a, a full traffic study of some story. Am I incorrect on this? It would have been an analysis of... Right. Yeah. So I think there's some, some room for discussion there on what really reasonably should be done. I think the safety plan at those intersections is becoming important because that, that appears to... Um, it, whether it's only eight more trips in the PM, more than what was already calculated, um, what we do know is that's still going to be about 200 more trips through those intersections on a given day, just in general, because of the number of people that will be living there, you know, 100, 150. And what that has for an impact on the safety aspects of those intersections is a worthwhile look to do possibly now, as it's been uh, suggested in a couple of the documents we have. So I, I'd like that to be a part of the discussion. Um, and again, I don't, I, I think there's enough here. Uh, I think you've heard enough uh, from you know, both the audience and this board, and I think staff has enough ideas that a, a sit down hopefully gets you through to a really good place. I think that buffering is important, um, and I and I don't. Th I just wanted to make a note that you know I don't think um, all of those trees need to be deciduous, but I think there are spots for those, and I think there's spots for the regular street trees that you see, and I I think a landscape you know a comprehensive landscape plan or a buffering plan. Uh, would help this board feel more at ease and hopefully the owners too feel it more at ease is about what's what's being proposed in their in their backyards currently so uh, with that I don't want to take it a whole lot further at this time you look like you have something well 
<laughs> Roger. <laughs> Do, I just wanted to uh, pertain to what Rick asked about um, Unit 7, and he asked about reducing, you know, taking a, a, making a two-story building. It, maybe you could look at either Unit 14 or 24 and just make those, absorb those six units in there. I don't, I don't know whether that would make any sense or not. Food for thought. You know, I'm going to work on everything else. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Carrie, do you have any other questions or clarifications you need from us at this moment? Um, no. I think we're all set. Jay? Are you all set? Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are going to take a five minute recess. Uh, we'll see you in a little bit. I used it all.
Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. Um, we have two uh, important changes. One, uh, Jen had to uh, run out unexpectedly, uh, so Rick Meinking will be made a voting member for the remainder of the agenda. Uh, next, as well, is uh, number 1090A Payne Road LLC request a site plan review for 289 Payne Road, Assessor's Map R52, Lot 4A. The applicant has requested to table this evening, so that will be off of the agenda for now. And up next, we have Cottages at Sawyer LLC request a final subdivision review for 98 Sawyer Road, Assessor's Map R59, Lot 8C. Jay. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let's see. So this application received a preliminary approval for a residential subdivision in the VR4 uh, zoning district um, back, I believe it was in July. Um, they're now before the board for uh, final site plan review. Um, it's, in essence, the application uh, includes 17 duplex units and uh, 58 single family units served by public roads and public uh, uh, sewer facilities. Um, so you will have received uh, staff comments along with peer review memos um, with regards to traffic and civil. Um, at this point, um, you know, I think the general parameters of the plan are, are you know, I think we, there's uh, some agreement around there, um, but there are some questions with regards to the details of the plans. I think one of the things that we've heard from some of the staff is that the, de the plan sets are uh, really a bit unclear um, in terms of um, the sort of final refinement of key comp pieces. Um, I think there's uh, another item that was flagged in staff comments was regard to the improvements along Sawyer Road. Um, there have been a discussion about sewer and the potential for a sidewalk along Sawyer, and so understanding sort of the final details of those as well. Um, something our public works uh, folks have sought is um, some updates with regards to apparently there's some uh, focal point, uh, there's some stormwater facilities within the right of way. And typically, you know, I would say that's a bit atypical. However, there have been projects that have ha included those. Um, but as part of that, there's um, usually a, uh, a memorandum of understanding that's um, ironed out uh, between the applicant and the public works folks as to regards to what responsibilities are whose and, and when the certain items are going to be accomplished. Um, and then uh, there was one question uh, that was identified in the uh, traffic peer review comment that had to do with sort of the land use code for trip generation and it may have just some slight modifications to the numbers but um, again I'm sure the applicant um, might be prepared to speak to those. So those are sort of the highlights again um, you've received the comments so I'm here for questions as we go. Thank you Jay. Turn it over to the applicant. Okay uh, good evening my name is Steve Bradstreet with Ransom Consulting. Uh, with me tonight is the applicant, Mark O'Leary, uh, and also uh, Amber Fernland uh, from uh, Ransom Consulting to answer any other questions that I might not be quite prepared to. Um, what I wanted to, if, if Jay could pull up C100. What I want to do is just uh, get into some of the, uh, I, I say major change. There was one major change on on the plan that um, is in the plan set, but uh, you may not be quite aware of the difference. Uh, on all the screens uh, is uh, C100, which is our uh, phasing plan, which I learned a lot about tonight. Um, but I was, I think does follow what uh, our, the applicant is looking um, to do in regards to the actual phasing. Uh, he has only one way in, and that's off Sawyer Road. So the first phase is everything up to um, uh, a wetland area that traverses from the southwest to the northeast on the site. And then phase two uh, is everything beyond that to the right. Phase three is to the left, even though once he gets done phase one, he may uh, opt to combine phase two and phase three if things are going well. Um, the, the major change that we were talking about is in one of the comments from Randy Dutton 
uh, in actually his May 31st or so uh, comments was that because Preservation Way that comes off of Sawyer Road and goes through the development up to phase two and phase three has a lot of uh, potential uh, trips generated from phase two and phase three. The classification we had looked at as being um, a access, a residential access street, whereas the trips actually bump it to a sub collector, which has a different standard in regards to um, one item primarily, and that is the radius of the curves. And I have a laser that is sort of pointing it out on the screen. That one we had as 100, and this one we had as 100. Um, those two had to go to 150 with a tangent uh, length in between. So that alignment slightly changed, and where a landlocked lane comes into that first curve, it slightly changed the alignment of that. So that is the, uh, the biggest change on the entire plan. The lot stayed the same, uh, except for in that immediate area, but all the other uh, lots within the subdivision stayed the same, uh, and with phase one, et cetera. Um, we did at the uh, last meeting um, request four waivers that I believe were um, all granted, um, but I will uh, read them out again, is the reduction of the paved road width to 22 feet from 24. 24 is the same for a sub collector or an access, residential access street. Sidewalk on only one side um, with the uh, contribution from the applicant uh, for any sort of future extension to the sidewalk south on Sawyer Road that was uh, uh, being considered there and had been discussed with the, uh, the town at the time. The left-handed, left-sided hammerhead, uh, which is on Landlock Lane up here because of wetland impacts, etc., cetera. We uh, asked for that waiver. It's typically on the right. Uh, Public Works weighed in, so did the fire department, and that was all acceptable. And Angela uh, also, um, she brought it up as a comment, but she also accepted the uh, response from Public Works and the fire department. And then the waiver of the road separation distance of 300 feet. That came up again in the comments, most recent comments, but that had been in the middle of the last time, and I believe, uh, but I, someone can correct me, that uh, it was discussed at that time and approved. And that is up in phase three between Bungalow and Preservation Way. The distance between them is 290 feet, center line to center line, I believe, and instead of the 300. And we asked for a waiver there. That was discussed also with Public Works and Fire to determine if that affected any of their uh, access, their plowing, and things like that. And that was. Uh, actually last fall, late summer, that uh, we had that discussion, and that was acceptable. Um, what we'd like to uh, note also in here is that we have gone through all the review comments, um, and a lot of them, uh, in uh, my opinion, are graphics in nature. Uh, some of the setbacks um, we had as 15 when, but they abut an abutting property that is not owned by the applicant, so there should be 25. It's an easy fix, line work on there, and fixing the 25 to, or 15 to 25 in the table. The buffer, same thing from section eight. There is a buffer requirement for abutting properties not under our ownership. Um, and in most cases, but that only applies, that's footnote number two and three on that table, and that applies to duplex multi Plex units, and those are only applicable to um, lot, uh, it, there's five lots that it's applicable to, and in most cases we already have a buffer there. Some of them we don't have it on the side yard, we have to provide that. So that's not an issue in providing a, uh, the buffer that is required uh, for those lots. It just is not uh, shown on the plans at this time. What we have uh, discussed and, and still planning on doing, and that was actually one of the comments, uh, is that um, lots three and 35 
will have uh, multiple units on it. They are uh, five duplexes, I believe, on lot 35, and then four single family and three duplexes on lot three. Those have to come back before you uh, for site plan review. Uh, it goes through the whole process of site plan review. So at this time, they're, not, they're shown with the development areas on them, but they do not have the detail that is required for site plan review. And the comment uh, by the uh, staff was that uh, those areas would be uh, reviewed subsequent to subdivision plan review. So in other words, after we get through this, then we come back. Uh, we cannot do anything on lots 3 and 35 until we get uh, our site plan applications uh, in uh, uh, to the town for review. What we're actually considering, uh, because of the, um, the lot 3 uh, area uh, and what we might want to do with it and the abutting property to the north that we're donating uh, or that the applicant is donating is that there is uh, additional consideration of well maybe there will be more land that is donated or deed restricted we haven't come up to the point of whether or not we would donate it to the land trust except for that 4.52 that we've already said or that it would be considered as open space deed restricted uh, area and so there may be more on phase one towards lot three uh, anything sort of east of lot one and landlocked lane uh, is still under consideration that we may be donating additional land uh, to the land trust or to be uh, deed restricted um, at the last time we had some landscape plans that were uh, hand-drawn um, there was a comment that they should be uh, more um, final and so those are now in your, your plan set of all the open space areas, all the landscaping that is uh, going in there, all the other amenities of, uh, that we'd like to potentially see gazebos or fire pits or benches and, or a playground for uh, kids or a senior area. Um, those are on those uh, plans that are attached to the back um, of the set of plans. The question in regards uh, which came up from staff and it came up from um, Wood and Kearns, two comments that they emailed, was the sewer out in Sawyer Road. Uh, as you are aware, the reconstruction of Gorham Road at the intersection uh, has been completed, uh, call it, and as part of that uh, construction, our client uh, has paid for and had installed by a contractor the force main that was designed by uh, our subconsultant um, uh, that went from so the Sawyer Road across Gorham Road, turns and goes easterly to a, uh, under the triple culverts through a slip, uh, pipe sleeve and to a terminus manhole. That's already installed and already approved by the water district, excuse me, sewer district um, last year and then the rest of it from uh, virtually Gorham Road to the development and into the development uh, was designed uh, and presented to the sanitary district they reviewed it um, and they approved it at the November 21st board meeting this last year so the sewer out there uh, has already been approved that sewer will be um, directional board uh, there will be no open cut directional board under the edge, edge of the pavement uh, the entire length from our entrance all the way to Sawyer Road where, where it will reconnect at the request of um, the sanitary district David Hughes um, did not want any service connections along Sawyer Road specifically because he has had and I don't know which ones, and maybe somebody with more history in the town knows. There are other developments that one did not have it, uh, or that they don't have it, um, but there's others that have had it, and no one has connected to it. And he spoke of one within the last 10 years, and I, I can't remember which one, but that have not uh, connected, so he didn't see a use for it. He also said that every time you have a connection, you have uh, I believe it's 
six fittings. You've got sleeves um, and the gate valve and the Y in, in the road. And this is under the pavement or on the edge of the pavement. And there's a possibility of 17, I believe, connections along there. And he did not want all those potential leaking joints to be his responsibility in the future because he is will be accepting responsibility for the uh, sanitary sewer. So for that reason, and the design plans, I think it was indicated in one of the comments that there were there was no design for it. Uh, that design was on plans C111 to C116 and detail sheet C138, I believe, that had all the details that um, design and details that were approved by the sanitary district um, at their board meeting in November. So they have approved that and, uh, and the design has been approved by them. The, the company that actually did the physical hydraulic design uh, is uh, FR Mahoney, it's E1. E1 is a type system that uh, is used, has been used uh, in, in Scarborough and David, uh, Mr. Hughes, approves the use of that. Um, so I think that the, the sanitary out in Sawyer Road is, uh, it has been approved and, I don't, and uh, that might not have been brought to everyone's attention at the time uh, because it was November 21st that uh, the approval occurred. Um, there are other um, items that were uh, mentioned in some of the uh, comments that were, as I said, graphical in nature were of setbacks. Um, you didn't show any stop signs. You didn't show an ADA uh, ramp here, et cetera. We have the details, I believe, on C-136 of a stop sign, of a stop bar, and of ADA ramp details for construction um, where, the, where it would be used uh, within the development. As far as being shown on the plans, it's not specifically shown. Um, as indicated uh, by Jay, uh, there might have been some uh, additional detailing needed uh, or confusion, um, and I'm not quite sure what that might be, but um, those can be put on there. There's only uh, uh, six, seven stop signs and stop by. So it, it's not that much that would be added to the plans. Um, there was one comment of there was no underground electric shown. Um, what is shown is a symbol uh, with the designation UGU, underground utility. And the underground utility is not water, it's not sewer, it's not storm drain, it is uh, electric and communications. Gas is totally separate, but it's electric and communications. And that is on the plans and shown entering every single lot. There's four utilities entering every single lot. There's water, sewer, gas, and then the power communications enter every lot, and that's shown on the utility plans. The, um, I won't say the last comment, uh, because I'm sure that I'm uh, going over some of these fast, is the um, street trees. Uh, the requirement is two trees per lot. These lots, for the most part, have 50-foot frontages. And if you look at a 50-foot frontage and you take a 12-foot driveway and you have the water and the sewer that have to be separated by 10 feet, the water cannot be under a driveway per uh, district requirements. Then you add the electric and everything else. And then you want to drop two trees in there, it's extremely tight. We've had the, the discussion with town staff that we will provide the one per lot or in the frontage of the lots, but the others will be made up in other areas. Um, we have areas that don't have any lots, and so we'll be providing street trees along those areas at a spacing that is required to develop the two per lot. We have open space areas, we have a, an orchard going in on the corner of Raglan Road. We have, uh, and that is right up here, this little triangular area is a, uh, is, will be an orchard. This playground and senior area will have landscape, or has landscaping. And then right under the 
P in phase one is another open space that has um, all sorts of other amenities plus the landscaping. So uh, we believe that we cover, totally cover the uh, uh, tree requirement uh, within the, uh, the subdivision. Um, I, lighting. Um, there was a comment on lighting and there is a detail on C136 that is the town's standard detail of the light pole, the base, the fixture, what type it is, etc. cetera. Um, what uh, was not uh, specifically shown on the plans, which is, uh, would be on the utility plans, is we are looking at uh, the utility poles, or the light poles being located at uh, intersections and at bends in the road. So in other words, you'd have one out at Sawyer Road, right where Landlock is, more than likely at the end of landlock, this intersection, this intersection, this intersection, and this intersection, and then possibly over here where the bend in the road is. It, it is for that purpose, to light up the intersection or where the alignment in the road changes dramatically that you may not be uh, aware of when you're coming in. Um, we did, and I failed to mention this, we did get a DEP stormwater permit uh, in November. Uh, we have the NR. PA permit also, um, and I believe that uh, based on discussions with uh, Bill Bray and the comments that we got from Randy uh, Dunton, I'm not sure if there was a little mix-up if Randy didn't get the whole thing, but he kept on referring back to the traffic study and not to the response letter with the additional sheets. And uh, we had discussions with Jay early on that the traffic study did not have to be necessarily um, replaced in, in its entirety with the updates, but we could append what was in the response. And that's what we did, but I don't know if Randy picked up on that because some of his comments sort of referred back to the traffic study itself um, and not to the additional data that we provided. But other than that, I think that we uh, addressed, we will address, uh, but uh, where it, it Acknowledging the comments, um, I think we're very comfortable with those comments. Any of the uh, comments, a lot of them are minor, and as I said, graphical um, in nature. So I think that uh, with this, um, and then coming back before the uh, board for lots of that area, phase one to the right of lot one, and then lot 35, um, coming back to the board for that, uh, site plan review, we'll have this uh, project uh, sort of nailed down. And uh, Mark O'Leary, I think, is has a few comments, so I'm going to turn it over to him. Hello again. Uh, a couple of clarifications. The first one I'd like to go back on is the SOAR extension in Sawyer Road. With my conversation with David Hughes, it's not that we don't want to allow, or he doesn't want to allow connectivity. He doesn't want it sitting there, not being used. That was the reason for that. I've actually spoken to ETTI, which is going to be the company that does the boring, uh, and negotiated down just as far as I think I possibly can for those people along the street. Um, they've been, uh, the last time I spoke with David, which was a couple weeks ago, he was sending out a letter to all the people on the street, so I believe that's been addressed. Um, and another thing that we saw on the peer notes and the uh, staff notes was that uh, the um, transformers were partially in the right of way. We will pull those out of the right of way because uh, those are all deeded, those, those lots. Um, the number of trees were going to exceed by far the number we're required to put in. And much like what you asked in the last applicant, we're using a variety of trees. Uh, wherever there is a buffer needed, they will be a true buffer. It's not going to be a, uh, a pretty tree. It's, it's going to do its job. Um, Steve touched upon the open space. Uh, in conversations, the more I looked at this, the more we could really preserve a lot of the land, especially behind 
lots 34 and 35 where phase two is written. Um, there's no reason not to preserve all that land as well. In looking at the lights that we just discussed, uh, that Steve touched on that note, I believe where we go over uh, the, uh, the box culvert is, um, which would be right in here. I believe between this stretch and this stretch, we should put a light. I think that's a long run without any kind of light. Um, so I'd probably add one there. The last time we were here, we touched on sidewalks and the uh, ability to add to uh, the one in Sawyer Road. The, and per request, I asked that, that any funding that was in lieu would go towards only Scarborough Road on that, as well as in uh, the recreational fees. Um, in getting a quote on bringing it uh, roughly 1,200 feet, um, I'd, I'd like to put out $25,000 in lieu of. Uh, I'm not trying to come in with a low number. Um, that's pretty much what I've got. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, we do have an opportunity for public comment on this item. If there's anyone here that would like to speak on this topic, please approach the podium and state your name. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Uh, for this one, I think uh, take a little bit different approach here. And um, there's, you know, staff was kind of enough to kind of highlight, and, and I appreciate uh, the applicant coming in and kind of addressing head on a lot of the issues brought mm -hmm. up in staff comments. Um, that always helps uh, helps make our job a little easier when we need to grind down to the real topics still at hand. So. Yes. Um, I think, I think for purposes of this board discussion, I think what I'm really interested in hearing about is uh, how the board feels about the sidewalk, uh, either A, being built by the contractor, or B, accepting an in lieu uh, payment. Um, I don't want to misrepresent um, staff. So my understanding, though, however, is that I think you would prefer, staff would prefer the developer uh, construct the sidewalk along Sawyer. Uh, yeah, I, and I think you know, it sort of just goes back to the um, provision of the VR4 that requires sidewalk on both sides of a street within a subdivision unless the board approves an alternative uh, measure. Um, and so, you know, I'm not sure how many linear feet are sort of within the, si within the subdivision, um, but I think, you know, constructing and, and doing, extending the sidewalk from Sawyer um, up to the project is fitting with the zoning context, fitting with the Oak Hill pedestrian plan, and sort of assures it'll get done in a more uh, efficient time frame. So, okay, um, that's staff's point of view. We've heard an, an offer from the applicant. I'd like the board to quickly just weigh in on whether or not uh, which direction we would like to advise the applicant on, on this one. So, we want to jump head first into this. <coughs> Roger, um, I would I would go along with that. Which, which would that be? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> so which, uh, which are you leaning towards here? What Jay just said. Staff, staff is recommending yeah. Yeah, that the uh, applicant build uh, either We're of the We're talking about from uh, Gorm Road up to the site, right? Correct. That's well, the sidewalk in question, correct? Yeah, we we were coming from in Sawgrass. Of, yeah, in, in lieu of... Um, from where? So, yeah, I believe the discussion oh, the other, the other side. has been from, um, if you recall, when the Sawgrass subdivision went in, they brought the sidewalk um, a distance up Sawyer Road. I can't remember where it ended uh, mm -hmm. at a particular point, but yeah. they brought it a distance. And there's a, a, a pretty good bend in Sawyer Road for those who've been down there. Um, and that really does seem to be a problematic area for pedestrians. Um, so to be able to provide a dedicated space that gets them, one, a connected sidewalk back to uh, a Memorial Park here and, you know, interconnected. Um, but more importantly, through that curve, it will remain us with a, a remaining stretch that still needs to be closed. Um, but we think that that's really the, um, coming from the uh, sawgrass side up to the project is what's been talked about. Okay. Right. That also engulfs the uh, school campus. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. 
Rick? So there would be a sidewalk on one side of the street in the subdivision, though, right? That's Correct. For, okay, I just don't want to get lost. So mm -hmm. there'd be four. I think what they're asking for is to put one sidewalk on one side in the subdivision and then a sidewalk up to the corner of Sawyer Street. Yes, that would be. That's. And that's that discussion came out of the fact that they were supposed to have two sidewalks throughout the subdivision, and instead we said it'd go for one, but we want to see the, so the Sawyer Road connection kind of made. Right, I'd be, I would agree with staff. Rachel Rick? Yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm a little, would be a little more comfortable knowing how much it would, the town thinks it would cost. Uh, the applicant is offering $25,000. Uh, in lieu of, um, what's the actual price? I, I think without having a construction plan set and having uh, folks <coughs> do an estimate, I, I, I can't tell you if that's a good number or not. I'm yeah, not and honest. and that's that's what I'm struggling with. Is that a reasonable? Uh, is that a reasonable number? And I recall from the uh, Ballantine subdivision, we had a comment of basically looking at a, a public-private partnership working a lot on the sidewalk on Ward Street. And it sounds to me as though this is another opportunity to do that with the town offering to finish some sections or needing to finish some sections. And another section being um, done by the developer, but absent a good sense of cost, I, I don't know where I come down. We need the sidewalk, that's clear. Somebody's gonna pay for it, that's also clear. Um, is $25,000 reasonable or should we say, well, that's nice, but how about 35? We, I, I just don't know. Uh, so I'm, I don't have a decision. To help you with that, um, I have a quote on the section we we're talking of. Oh, of, good. Thank you. Of 27.3. Yeah. You know what? I want to jump back in because I was confused. I thought that what we were agreeing to was that the contractor instead of the in lieu, the contractor was going to put in these sidewalks because it was different in the, I think it's, there's no, there's no challenges, I guess I should say, that would, you know, in some subdivisions, there are challenges to putting in the sidewalk because of poles and things like that. In this particular case, I don't want to see, I don't really want to see the town's resources used up doing the sidewalk, I would rather see it as part of the subdivision and rather than an in lieu fee and then wonder if that's in lieu fee is going to be enough. I think that the contractors put in sidewalks every day. I, I think that if they're putting in the subdivision, they should put in the sidewalk. That's my thoughts. Right. Yeah, I'm inclined to say <clears throat> as long as you've got the equipment there, you're building the sidewalks within the um, development. Why not just have the uh, contractor put them in? Okay. That's the way we started. Uh, in our June meeting, that's when the in lieu of fee came up from the board. Um, that's why we brought it back this way. We appreciate the offer. Um, but I think we'll have, have your guys way. out there and keep them busy. Um, Perfect. The uh, other item. Save you money. I, I know this was. Um, it was brought up, I appreciate the sewer discussion. Um, there was a question, and I, I don't know if I fully understood the, if this was incorporated into what you had provided us with a response, but uh, the stub outs on the sewer line, you're, you're, what you're saying is you're being told that that's not what they want at this point? Uh, that, that's what uh, David Hughes has told us, and we've had a couple meetings with him, that he'd prefer not to have the stub outs. He said that uh, typically what he has found historically is that People do not come in and connect uh, to that. It's a fairly expensive proposition to cut into a street and put in a sewer after the fact, stub in after the fact. So he, and plus, these are all, and I believe it was 17 homes, am I mistaken? Potentially, yes. Potentially, and that's 17 connections that may never be connected to a home, and they're all potential leakage areas. And so that's, that's the big reason. It's not so much that hey, no one's going to come in after the fact. It's the leakage potential that is now going to be under a public road that he's going to own. 
the utility, and uh, he does not want that. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have another question. I thought the density dictated that this this district, the zoning dictates that those houses have to be on sewer. So it's a requirement that the development be on sewer. The question is the houses along Sawyer that the sewer line is going to go past. I think the comment in the discussion that occurred um, at the interdepartment meeting is that um, this area is in a threatened um, stream watershed and that part of it's uh, what is being threatened by our potentially failing septic systems. Um, and so I think it was really sort of talked about, you know, is this an opportunity to provide stub outs? Um, and I think really it's, this is at the discretion of the board. The staff's looking for you to sort of help us figure this out because is, is there an opportunity to enable that so future connections are um, more readily available should someone's septic system fail? Um, rather than doing a replacement septic system, could they then plug, um, connect into the sewer system without, as I think was just sort of talked about, maybe costly or down the road to come in and tie into this, to, to the uh, line that's being put in now rather than to put stubs in now. But um, we're really looking for the board's direction. It, there's not an easy answer on this one. And if I can so add to that. All the new development though, all the new house lots are yes. all gonna be on sewer. Yes. yes. Okay. I just want to make sure I was clear on that. Yes. Yep. In my conversation with David Hughes, he anticipated that uh, he might, we may get three or four people along the, the street that would actually want to hook up. When they bore the road, they will have three openings on the side of the road. Um, the idea is to put these so that any opening that was made to put the laterals in, that we could do two. So houses across the street from each other. Um, in his direction, he told me, land somewhere in the house. In other words, let the frontage, let the uh, underground come into the house itself directly. That was his request. Uh, the other thought that he asked me about, he says, what are you gonna look for for compensation for them tying into your sewer? I'm not looking for anything. They'll have the cost of doing the lateral um, providing their own pump. I've got it down to a little over $2,100 with ETTI um, for each one of these laterals, plus whatever it costs to open it up. We're gonna have the potential to have six of them done right then uh, without having an opening fee, just the, the lateral cost itself. I don't think it can get any cheaper than that. Um, you put a septic system in right now, you're probably talking in those small lots, at least $15,000. We're going to, even with the E1 pump, which is the best pump you're going to buy, it's going to come in considerably less. So. <clears throat> Roger. <clears throat> the, um, the line you're going to put in along Sawyer, that's going to be on the north, the north side of Sawyer. Is that correct? <clears throat> correct. The same side as your development? Yes. And are you, <clears throat> are you talking about putting a sleeve or something under the road on the, on the south side? On like, the, no, if somebody wanted to hook up, they'd actually bore it right there. No, you, you, you had mentioned uh, three or four. There'd be three or four that would go across the street that could accommodate a couple of homes. What's going to happen? Um, they cannot bore the 1,800 feet, okay? Yeah. So they're going to open it up in three spots, and these are small openings. But we could also put two laterals in there going north and south in those holes, and that would accommodate six of the houses right there. Yeah. Once again, it's keeping their costs down. And the other thing, I think um, you indicated that the uh, uh, sanitary district was going to send out letters. Whether they have or not, I don't know. Can't, can't they, when they send out the letters, Jay, can't they basically tell, like, explain to the homeowners that you have a certain time frame, you have to either commit to do this or... I mean, is, is that possible or something like that? I would have to defer to the sanitary district and what yeah, they yeah, okay. have the authority to do. Yeah. I, yeah. I, know, I know those homes along there have had water problems. Uh, Doesn't surprise me. Yeah. I mean, it, there's a brook that runs right behind the, there. Because mm -hmm. um, when we're building the library, that was a big issue. Um, so. And it actually becomes less than the 17 for the simple reason that the two abutters 
coming in right here. Yeah. This septic system's in the back. I would like to come off of uh, Preservation Way and put him a, uh, a tie-in right. at no cost to him while we're doing it. And I'm not sure where this one, the Wilson's septic system is. Uh, he has expressed that he'd like to tie in. If it's out back, there may be the potential for me to do it from that road as well. Do, do you mind if I ask no, a go right ahead. question? Could, could you describe the laterals you're it, it sounds like you're suggesting that you, you would put those in when you do the open. I guess I'm just a little unclear on what you're uh, Do you mean coming up Sawyer Road? You said at the, at the three openings you're going to have, you referenced these laterals that could at least get to, you know, what, two homes or something like that per opening? Correct. Is when, that what, are when, you talking about putting those in, or is that what could happen? I, I just If the residents are at that location okay. were some of the ones that wanted to come forward and do it. Gotcha. Um, I think that's keeping the amount down as much as I possibly can. Okay. Um, when, when, Excuse me, when you say laterals, are you talking about the homes along the north side of, of Soya, or are you talking about the homes on the south side? Mm -hmm. The side where the water is? <laughs> uh, the opposite side of the development. Yeah, okay. Okay, so the even numbers, okay. if that helps you. And uh, what, what exactly is a lateral? Is that like a sleeve? Is that uh, a no, I'm using that as a, a connection. Oh, That's just, all coming just across like underground. Just, just like a T. Yep. Correct. Right off the main, the main. It, it's an inch and a quarter service line because it's a pressure system. Yeah. It's an inch and a half service line that comes in is either teed or wide into the four inch that we're drilling all the way through. It's just wide in, stubbed out, capped at off the road for the homeowner to attach, uh, connect to if they so choose. And, and the main line is going to run along the side of the road or is it going to go down the middle of the road? Side it's of the road, north side, under the edge of the pavement. Okay. That's where discussions with the sanitary district that would go. Okay. Uh, thank you. Appreciate the uh, explanations behind that. Uh, the only other note I had. I, I do have another one. On, on this, on page, I don't know what page is. But it states on here, uh, note, footnote number 11, the septic disposal system in portable well locations. Now, you're, you're going to have sewer in, so shouldn't that be eliminated? Yeah, we have public water and public sewer. Yeah. So if there is a note on the subdivision plan that refers to wells or septic fields, that's in there in error. Okay. Everything's public. All right, so the... Uh, um, note 11? Right, yeah, note 11. Okay. Did you find it? Yep. Okay. Um, the other item I had here was a, a demarcation of open spaces. Um, are you comfortable with the staff recommendation for split rail fence, some, some boulders of some sort? Or? Absolutely. I'd, I'd rather get it on the ground and decide how to do it. Uh, the back of lots five, six, seven, um, the board had asked to uh, clearly mark that so we weren't going into uh, the open space of the wetlands. I plan to use large rocks there. Um, when we get into uh, the two open spaces over in here, which one's designed, one isn't, uh, I was thrilled to hear the staff comments that we would rather see what a, uh, this is conceptual, we'd rather see what the homeowners association wants. It's not that I'm not trying to do it, I'd rather make people give them what they want, so. And, and I'll just sort of reference that that's, I think, learnings that this board and staff has, have had. Um, I think the Sawgrass subdivision is a great example. It was before this board not too long ago where, you know, sort of having the open space and the developer crafting what was going to go in there and then the residents ultimately wanted something completely different and so um, after some we got figured out but why don't we figure it out at the uh, front front end and then rather than the back end so I appreciate that uh, so if there's any other questions from the board um, I'd like to 
going to throw it out there if there's anyone that has something. <coughs> Rachel. Well, I, I don't have a, a question so, so much as some comments. The, these are modular homes, correct? Is that what I remember? Yes, they are. Um, I just want to say that uh, I think your timing is impeccable in terms of bringing us these, this uh, development. Um, if WEX comes with another 800 to 1,200 employees in the Downs, we're going to have a lot of people looking for homes that they can afford and homes that are close by and homes that are well done. Uh, and I think this is the sort of subdivision that will add to the town and uh, be an attraction for, for the workers as they come in. So thank you. I can tell you that the, uh, the, the request we've had already, and my son Ryan is going to be the realtor for the whole thing. Um, if I had permits in hand, this would, would be over with. Uh, one thing in trying to keep this very affordable, the longer we wait, um, I know I'm going to be looking at a 3% hike in those coming right up. And on some of the infrastructure, uh, there's as much as a 7% hike coming the 1st of February. So I'm trying to lock everything in just as quick as I can. Um, like everything else, it's cost, cost, cost. Thank you. Uh, just, just one Roger, last, go ahead. Just one last thing for my clarification. I've never quite understood the potential right away, and it seems like it's zigzagging up there to me. One of the comments that was that came back from I'm not sure if it was, uh, I believe it was staff was, uh, you know, they'd love to see that be a more of a road design. So what we're looking at, and Steve mentioned it, is anything other than lot one. I would like to take this area, uh, this area and bring it back in for site plan, which would, in, which would include that right of way. Um, I think there's more work to be done on that area. As much as I would like to get the, the 10 senior rentals that I have planned here, um, I think we need to get it right, so. And that may also include creating a little bit more uh, land that is either uh, conserved or given to the land trust? Because right now... Uh, I, I, I just sort of suggest and, 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 and note that I think staff, you know, appreciates the, the discussion that the uh, applicants have with us in terms of trying to connect that, or not in trying, and committing to uh, tying that 50-foot wide right away back towards the Gorham Road, which could potentially allow for a future connection. I think, you know, the board has started to actually, we saw a sketch plan of a subdivision that starts to you can start to see the connection but i think to one of the sort of earlier question or actually i think it might be right in our our memo is just really wanting to see that a little bit more defined i think as you know we sort of look at the plan it's hard to see where so i think um you know as, as mr bradstreet was referring to i think some there's just sort of a, a number of these sort of cleanup issues that if we all sort of agree on the direction um that there's no reason we can't can't get there in sort of good order. And, and I think that's uh, a reason why uh, we had that discussion for the right of way to come off of the Hammerhead and go over. Mm -hmm. But because of everything that's happening over there in Lot 3 area, um, I, I think it makes sense to look at that area a little bit closer to incorporate as much as we can for either development or donated land and then looking at potential access. So are you at, at this point sort of rethinking of configuring it such that it w the continuation would come off sort of where my mouse is? Oh, no. Oh, okay. No. no, no, I, all right. I, no. The problem is, is I want to look at the whole thing and figure it out yeah. the right way. Sure. Um, so this you're, is all wetlands right here. You're still right talking here. about coming generally like in this pattern? Correct. Generally. Okay. I mean, it, it has to come this way if, if the connectivity ever happened. Right. But that's all wetlands as well. So right. I would rather bring that whole section, the, the right-of-way section, as well as everything uh, east of uh, Lot 1 in as one package and, and not make mistakes. I'm not in a hurry. It's, the rentals were going to come at the end um, as much as I'd like to jump in there for the simple reason that when you start talking 12 lots, um, and that and that are going to be uh, model homes for the whole project. It doesn't give me a lot of return in phase one. Um, 
we would certainly like to, ideally, this year we'd like to engulf uh, phase two as well. Um, it's just a matter of getting started. So. What, what, what is that, that parcel right above three? Right, right above three. Right you know, there? It looks like there's a parcel there, but there's no number in it. Well, that one right there? Yes. That's part of three as well. Oh, it is? What, yeah. What is shown on there, bringing the confusion in, is, is that is the building envelope meeting the setback requirements of the wetland and property boundaries. Okay. That's why it looks like a, it's highland. It's not wet. And so that is still uh, lot three, but the northern section and the southern section. That's okay. all. Looks good. So, um, unless I hear any further planning board comments, what I'd like to recommend on this is um, have this come back as a consent item. Basically, you're there, but I think you need just a little bit of cleanup. Um, and then at the next uh, cycle, be at the top of the agenda just as a consent. Don't have to rehash this unless staff tells us there's a red flag somewhere. I know that's probably not. The Best thing you want to hear well, it's, it's not that far off. Um, I think we can tweak this right now. <laughs> um, can we do with some conditions? The reason being, I would love to walk back in in two or three days and, and buy the uh, growth permits because um, that's going to be part of this is making sure you have permits and things. Before the first of the month, I would love to lock in with a modular company. Uh, three percent on these is going to add five thousand dollars a house on I'd, I'd much rather be able to sell these houses for less money uh, and not just pay it out because it was a hike I'll, I'll say I'll let the board weigh in unless Jay you have something you want to we'll act at the direction of the board at this point we don't have anything prepared but we can figure it out yeah we need it to I, I, I tend to agree with the uh, developer and Let's, let's go with some conditions. Rick? Yeah, I'm fine with that. It means 3%. You're okay with that? Yeah, yeah I, I, an awful lot of this, as was stated, is, is simply graphics. So if we can find the language that says um, that what the developer must do as part of the consent is to uh, give us the plans that incorporate, uh, that in, incorporate trying to figure out how to say it but basically what they've said on one sheet we need to see on a plan uh, on another sheet and, and that's what we would be looking for that's all we need uh, because we don't have any real questions about design we just don't see it on the plans we just don't see where the crosswalks are we don't see where a tip down may be so um, if we can figure out how to say that Basically, we've got everything here. It just didn't get translated. So if we can do that, I'm fine. I, I guess one of the things I'm trying to piece through is where we don't have a plan that's ready for signature, which means this won't get recorded for at least the three more weeks. We can't do growth permits until we have a plan that's recorded because the lots don't actually get articulated until the plan's recorded. I'm, I'm a, we can, I can certainly work at the board's direction to come up with some conditions. I think with a couple more weeks, staff could spend a little more time in our, and work with the applicant to revise the plan so we don't quite have as many. We don't miss something. Um, I think it was already identified that, um, you know, there's a plan note that needs to be removed and those sorts of things. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm sort of looking at the, the, the developer, and I appreciate sort of all the other constraints you're under, but I think if one of the real drivers is around the issue of growth permits, I don't think that a approval tonight is going to be what gets you there. Um, if there's other things you're working towards, I, I still think we're looking at the three weeks until the board can sign these plans. Yeah, and, and I respect that tremendously. Yeah. yeah. Um, what I'm looking for is somewhat commitment so that I can lock in with some of this. Um, I don't know if any of you have been down on Sawyer Road. I've had the land cleared uh, in the past week. Um, they've done a terrific job. There was never a complaint about anything going out onto Sawyer Road. And it's just because of how this is built out. 
um, were kind of from the outside in, and I did not want to lose another three or four weeks uh, when the roads get posted and things like that. So, I think uh, I think what we're offering uh, this evening is as close to as a full approval as you're going to see. Uh, I mean, we're we're basically saying you're coming back as a formality in three weeks, and we're pretty much going to as Perfect. long as staff likes what they see, it's going to go through without a whole lot of this question and answer session, we'll say that. Yep, I, I think Perfect. as uh, the chairman just pointed out, for those who haven't been through or seen our, our uh, sort of consent process, it is once, you know, plans are revised, staff has a draft motion and uh, the board opens it up and unless board members have some other concern that they haven't raised yet, but hopefully that's been addressed, it's as quick as reading the motion and it's, it's, a, it's a... Very good. Mo it's a quick, quick item. Very good. Okay. On behalf of my family and myself, thank you. Thank you. Wish you luck. Uh, this, this looks good, so yeah. good. good luck to you. Yeah. Uh, so at uh, 10 o'clock, we actually do not take up uh, new items. So unless um, our next item is going to last 12 minutes, um, people from RAM management may want to consider tabling until next meeting. Can I have you um, quickly introduce yourself and speak into the microphone? The people at home can't hear unless you're in front of a microphone. Thank you. Uh, my name is Howard Golden Farb. I'm president of RAM Management Company and owner of the facility property at 200 U.S. Route 1 known as Centervale Farm. Um, I understand we will not be heard this evening, and the next meeting is the 18th of February, am I correct? Correct. Um, there is an issue, I believe, Jay, that you and I have discussed regarding the uh, current ordinance. As the board might or might not know, we were approved about seven years ago, it seemed like yesterday, but for the same project, but because of economic conditions at the time, uh, we never went forward with the expansion of Centervale Farm to another development. When we submitted our application um, with the discussion with Jay and with our engineers at Tiger and Bond, it became apparent that there is a question regarding road frontage that either was not in existence at the time we were approved several years ago or was somehow an oversight on the part of some organization. Um, my question is, is it possible in the next three weeks or is it possible for the board, for the planning board to start the process or give us any direction on how that will be dealt with. So, so if I'm being unclear, maybe Jay can no. clarify what I'm if saying. I, I'm not I, quite sure of the, the actual technicality. If I could jump in real quick. Thank you. I've, the rumor mill said that uh, you might be better served waiting until February to show up anyways. Okay. <laughs> I'm so helpful, I know. Um, I think there's probably think something um, something that could happen within the community that would make your dilemma a lot easier to deal with. Fine, but I understand what Does you're saying. Does that make sense? And the next board meeting is the, the next planning board it's, meeting is the 18th. That would be correct. 18th. Thank you. So, uh, would the applicant like to table for this evening? Yes, we would. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> The next item on tonight's agenda is Gene Bradshaw, DBA, Mint Salon, block request a sketch plan review for 800 Technology Way, Assessor's Map U39, Lot 4727. Jay. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. As you just noted, this is for a sketch plan, so we're you know at a relatively high level of review um, before the applicant submits a formal application. This opportunity for the applicant to sort of ask any clarifying questions or get some direction from the board and for the board to get a good understanding of what will be coming before you, um, presumably in short order for, as a formal application. Um, so the applicant is before you, as, as was noted, in the Haggis Parkway Zoning District for roughly 8,200 square foot commercial building um, that's going to be uh, have some personal services. Um, you have received some staff comments and where sketch plan really is, you know, just that, it's sketch. We haven't delved into the full details. We certainly highlighted a number of things that will need to be worked out moving forward, but I think the one area that maybe um, requires some, you know, 
good direction at this point from the board has to do with the amount of parking that's being sought and how that fits with the town standards. Um, as we all know, we typically look to do a uh, reduction in parking or as minimal parking as we can due to pavement and stormwater concerns. But I think as this board also often says, we understand different users have different needs. So um, that's why we have these discussions. So um, I think that's really sort of the main element. As I said, uh, staff put together a host of other things. I'm sure certain we'll talk about, but I'll leave it at that for, for now. Thank you, Jay. The applicant, please uh, state your name and introduce your project. Sure. Uh, thanks a lot, everybody, for staying so late and working so hard tonight. Uh, my name is Jason Vafiatis with Atlantic Resource Consultants. Here on behalf of Gene Bradshaw, who owns uh, the Mint Salon Block. Uh, and I also have Ann Calendar here with me uh, from Whipple Calendar Architects. And uh, if there are any questions on the uh, structure, um, Ann can pop up and answer them. I'll try to go through this uh, quickly. Uh, so as Jay said, you know, we're, we're roughly 8,200 square foot uh, building. Uh, the, the footprint is only, I think, 7,200, but there is some, there's some uh, second story uh, storage space and uh, break space that constitutes that. Uh, this project is in the Enterprise Business Park. And uh, as you all know, that, that business park has the whole suite of uh, regulatory approvals. It has a site location uh, permit with the DEP, uh, traffic movement permit with the MDOT, uh, NERPA permit, as well as a Town of Scarborough uh, subdivision permit. So we will essentially be amending all of those permits as part of the uh, approval process. Uh, and I just, so we have been through uh, the town staff's comments and uh, it's always funny. I feel like our company is always up here fighting the minimum parking standard. I think the last two projects we did, we, we had to go over. Um, so I'll, I'll jump on that one quick as it seems to be the, the biggest uh, issue. So uh, Gene owns a facility in Falmouth, same facility, same, same program. Uh, parking is an issue there. Uh, they did have extra parking, but they, they tend to, in peak periods, uh, need more. And the reason for that is, if you look at the building plan that comes with this, uh, sort of the mock-up that they have the interior, she has 34 leasable spaces. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what that means is she could have, at one period of time, 34 sort of sub-consultants working uh, in this building. So when you couple that with they may, they're all typically there with appointments that you could essentially need 68 to 70 parking spaces at the peak time. Uh, Enterprise Business Park has a provision in their homeowners association, or uh, I guess it wouldn't be homeowners, but uh, landowner association, that uh, you can't park on the road. So we really need to keep this parking interior to the lot and uh, and, and provide as, as, as Gene's experience is, is as much as we can. So we are open to talking about what exactly that means, whether town staff needs to get like a, uh, a parking study at the existing facility is something that we've been looking into. Okay. Yep. <laughs> awesome. So um, that said, I will turn it over to the board for any, I'm sorry. We have an opportunity this evening for public comment. If there's anyone here that would like to speak, please approach the podium and state your name. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Now I will turn it over to the board. And uh, we're going to start with Rick Meinking this evening. All right. Well, number one, I saw the solar panels on the, on the roof, and I said if you're going to put those on, then the conversation with parking will get a little easier for me. Um, <laughs> Also to include, you know, making sure that your envelope is tight and we can probably um, keep from using different fuels and just have electricity going to that building. Uh, heat pumps or VRF systems might make a lot of sense. And uh, it will certainly help with your dedicated air supply and, and uh, pressurization because there's a lot of chemicals in this type of building and it probably the smell could get out. So just keep that in mind as well, right? This is gonna be a beauty salon, that kind of stuff. Um, the parking, um, you know better. Um, and I know from a little experience of a place in um, 
I guess Lucinda's day spa that was on Beach Ridge Road or that got pressed with parking and I know they built another one up by Cumberland with a lot more parking and that seems to have worked out so I'm I'm in your camp when it comes to um, the additional parking we might look at the surface of that parking and see if we could get the bituminous um, pavement in so that we can you know work with the storm water a little bit better and get more uh, through the ground than versus runoff um, I throw that out but generally speaking um, I would look to your expertise and if you're saying you need 76 lots or sparking spots or whatever I'll go along with that thank you Rick we'll go down to the other end for Rick DePerry yeah um, I don't really have a lot at this point other than for this for where we're at right now I think well, what we have is good there's a lot of details that need to be filled in as you move forward but um, yeah the, between the parking and the snow storage and the um, storm water sometimes I think where this lot is is pretty flat so it's storm water always gets interesting but um, yeah, I think what I have for right now is fine thank you Rachel yeah well I'm really ashamed to say that I, I missed something when I l first looked at this and I did not check the design standards. Um, Jay, perhaps you could help. Is on the Hikus Parkway along the design standards, are you is a developer required to have the door facing a street? Um, with, so there's a requirement for orientation towards the street and to have some friends fenestration. I guess I, I don't recall if the front door actually needs to face the street from the design standards and this being sketch plan, I, I don't think we dove to that level of detail. Um, so certainly something to be mindful of as we go forward, we can sort of take a look at that. And um, I think again, you know, where the design standards the board has some level of um, uh, discretion with design standards, perhaps there might, if, if that is a requirement but the board's generally comfortable. Perhaps there's other architectural features that could be considered. Um, you know. Well, it, I, the, the point is that actually the, the door is entirely hidden. Mm -hmm. um, it is not invisible at all. And that then started to raise the, the question with me. In the past when we've had questions about the visibility of the front door, it's we've been maybe a little squishy about it, but um, have accepted uh, a door on a side of the building. In this case, the door is fully hidden. You can't see it at all. Uh, uh, you just are seeing essentially the front of a building even if there's fenestration there. Uh, and so the orientation of the whole building really is a, a threshold issue on, on the design standards. And as I said, I, I, I'm ashamed to say I went right past that and looked at windows. Um, so uh, especially because um, this essentially is going to be quite visible to anybody coming off of the road to the downs. That is going to be you know, right there, right visible. Um, I think it's going to be OK where you've got the driveway. But again, that's something that I would want to take a look at because it's just kind of kitty corner to the road from the downs uh, and I, I don't know how how this group feels but all of a sudden you've got the road from the downs you've got a driveway offset by not a lot now it's a very slow air drive along there it does not a, it's not a high speed limit but um, that's a question <coughs> that I have that I would want you to take a look at. Uh, I fully understand the concept uh, with a spa of um, the rental of rooms, the rental of spaces, and the number of uh, the number of 
parking spaces that you really do need in a situation like that where you're dealing with uh, maybe 34 independent contractors, each, each with their space and their own uh, clientele and their own, some of their own timing. So that's not a problem for me. Um, I do, of course, always want to see what the landscaping is going to look like uh, and the visual appeal of, of the building. I do like the idea of the uh, uh, solar panels on top. That's great. Uh, so any, any movement of the building that all of a sudden we might have to think about uh, as long as it's oriented for the solar panels, that's, that's good. I, uh, so I, I, that's, that's, really, that's really all I had. I just got sort of stopped by the fact that I wasn't clear what we were doing in terms of the direction of the building. Yeah, and in response to that, I'm not all that well versed in the design standards, but I know that Foley's Fitness, same situation. We had the, the, the entrance completely in the back of the lot people drive in and park, and uh, so maybe we missed it on that one as well. Well, no, in Foley's Fitness, we did agree that there were some, a couple of doors in the front. Yep. And, and that became a question. Sure. Uh, and then the door, the doors, the main doors were on the side, but visible as folks drove by, um, which is what I meant that, you know, on the side with visibility. Uh, and if you look at the hospice, uh, that along Route 1, the door is on the side, but it was very specifically created to be visible uh, to anybody passing. So that it's not that the door needs to be right along the front, but that there does have to be, as I recall, there does have to be um, a visibility of that front entrance. And this doesn't, this doesn't show it. So I really need to check and I think we all need to check the design standards on that to see if there's something different for this particular area. Thank you. Thanks Rachel. Mm -hmm. Roger. Uh, so that begs the question, why was the building designed this way? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm the wrong guy I mean, to answer that is, question. Is there a particular reason it was positioned this way? <laughs> We started, I'm, well, I'm Ann, Ann Callender, speaking. Ann Callender, Whipple Calendar Architects. Um, when we started this design, um, we were looking at, um, I guess we had to sort of keep this, this, being close to the street face was one of the, I think within the, the development itself's guidelines that the building needed to be Sort of oriented to the road. So we're, um, it says because there's so many little suites, there's a there's a desire to have a lot of a lot of windows. So we sort of felt that that um, would keep that pedestrian scale. It would be of interest from wherever you're driving from, and it would be pretty evident to where the the, the uh, sort of bringing the entry into the middle allowed these suites to be um, easily assessed, you know, had not have long corridors to get to, to the individual tenant spaces. So. Um, so I think we have, you know, it's long on, so this would be the space that you see primarily as you're driving up. You can see signage, windows, and None of these spaces will look like the back of a building. Um, so they have the, the fenestration, the detailing of a village. Um, and I think because of this code, we weren't thinking <coughs> that you actually would want to come around the front of the building, you know, at the street because of the way that that code was written or that um, the design within the development. So. Uh, and then most of the people would be coming within the, the parking lot, you know, to the front door. So they would all see it once they drove in. There isn't a big pedestrian um, Route. There's no. I mean, I think it's changing now. I guess within the downs, um, but at this time, this development is pretty much coming off of of Route One on Enterprise. Uh, alternatively, you could consider flipping the building and moving the um, the driveway to the left. In other words, you flip the building so the long so that the um, 
the bottom of it, the L, mm -hmm. is actually becomes the top and the front becomes very visible. Just rotate it. Right. Are you just are you talking some mirror? Yeah. Uh, so you're this way? Or? No, move it to the other side of the lot. And then, and then the front is visible, the entrance is visible. Um, you have the same, you move the driveway over, uh, you have the same parking area, you have the same internal, and you've just flipped it and you have a door that is visible from the road, it's in the front. Um, again, that's something you need to, to take a look at in terms of our design standards. Uh, I think it's, if it's doable, certainly response to any questions I have, um, but I think it allows you to do the exact same building, the exact same parking, you're just moving, moving it, rotating it, is it 90 degrees? No, 180 degrees, and moving it to the side, to the left. I think we still have Roger. Roger's still uh, trying to go here, I think. I want to, re I want to reclaim my time. <laughs> have, have we determined if, if this is not correct based on So what, what the design standards say, um, and I'll sort of pick some. Um, so where possible entrances shall be clearly visible from the street and reinforced through site and ar ag uh, architectural features. Um, so that, I mean, that's sort of the... The main yep. statement, and then there's some other pieces in here under our facade design piece of the architecture chapter of our um, design standards. So we can certainly share those. Um, yep. And um, so I think that would be a question for this board: is what, you know, if. Yeah. Well, I, I would say one, see if they can make the changes to accommodate that, mm -hmm. and if not, then bring in the best you can and we'll take a look at what that looks like, especially along the technology way, you know. Um, regarding the, uh, the parking, this reminds me of Maine Medical because you guys know what you need versus what our guidelines say. So I'm inclined to go along with what you feel your needs are. So I, I'm done. Thanks, Roger. Hey, Nick, Rick, sorry, can Rachel, I jump Rick, back Rick. in? Yeah, we're good. Just for a second, could you flip that over, not to be devil's advocate, but I'm looking at I'm looking at this, which is the building across the street. <laughs> um, if you look at the other buildings that on Google Earth across the street, they don't. That's the other one across the street. I don't know if you can see that or not, no but the, both the doors on the buildings on either side of that lot, one of them is a big brick side, and the other one is a big same thing. So, I mean, I think we should adhere to the design standards whenever possible, and Rachel's got a good point. You can't even see that door, but it is interesting that those other two buildings to the left of that building in this picture are both both the sides of those buildings face the road. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong, I'm just, I can, I can, looking at those two buildings, I can see why that building was oriented the way, it, the way it was, but you can see the doors on the other buildings, but they're not. Um, I just been down that road a bunch of times and when it said the doors need to face the front, I'm thinking, I, I, I don't, I think that's the way it is right now. Are but you saying they don't face the front right now? No, they don't. Uh, that's okay. I, I think it looks like they face the side, and we were at the planning board when they were allowed in. Right. <laughs> uh, Jay, please make a note that we need to reprimand previous planning boards. <laughs> <laughs> please make a note. Rachel wasn't on that planning board. <laughs> so I'll, I'll jump in real quick. Uh, the... The neighbor next door. Um, it, Katad and Analytical. Have you had any discussion? I mean, it looks to me almost like you're. Sh I mean, you're right up on a lot line with, and it appears that they have some parking 
in the back. Am I completely wrong on this? No, uh, I'm glad you took it in this direction. So uh, through David Miley. <laughs> it's not intentional. Who, who, yeah, so, so David Miley, uh, we're David Miley's engineer for the whole park, as you have, we've been battling before about that. Um, he's actually been speaking with Katahdin Analytical. Um, they have a parking issue as well. They were looking to buy more land off of David um, to add to their parking. Uh, they were at, as of 35 days ago, unwilling to pay the price that he could give them because of this project's come along. And um, they weren't able to reach a deal, but they also were not interested in shared providing connectivity. Um, I had pitched this to David. That we could tie those parking lots together. Um, and that, that, that issue died pretty quickly. Okay. So, sorry. <laughs> had to ask. Yep. Um, I agree with um, Rachel. I think it's a game of Tetris. I think if you flip that around, um, because it would kind of almost answer my other question, which is how far away are these? Is this driveway to that Scarborough Downs? How you know? Are we talking 60 feet misaligned with this current design? Um, and just knowing that you've got the potential to fully book, you know, 78 parking spots at a given moment, you know, and it, everyone's got a 12 o'clock appointment, of course. You know, how many? How many cars are going to be coming on that weird kind of angle? Because you're not you're not really squared up there, and yeah. knowing how busy that downs would be, whether or not it's even wise to just flip it for the sake of having that driveway appear on the other side of your lot. Um, so, uh, just food for thought um, on that one. Outside of that, I think you know, I think I think a little little Tetris, and um, I would also encourage you to submit the the, the street side, the street view architectural um, it helps us to um, just because I, I don't know what that other side of the building looks like and that would sure. be the part that everyone drives by and sees so yep. that'd be very much a point of interest to this board I would su yep. suspect and so. it, yeah and, and we would submit full elevations with the, the full site package great so actually if I could just raise one more point and I, I may be talking out of my architect shoes but I think maybe a, a compromise could be to put I don't know if you're talking like a secondary access or something that looks like an entrance that can be used as a exit or something. I, I think with the way the building works, short of short of moving the building and sort of reconfiguring it, that they have the the entry sort of needs to be at the the base of the of the two the two wings. Um, just throwing it out there, if if we added a you know some sort of details where there it looked like there was a door maybe on the short end of the L. That was visible from the road as you come in. So maybe, like right here, like so that you know, if just throwing it out there that we could potentially add like, you know, a, a third entrance because there's a service entrance that's near the back. So yeah, I'd, I'd hate to, honestly to get stuck on the fact that you need a door somewhere that's so. on that street for the sake of having a door. Sure. But uh, just looking at the general configuration, I, I'm worried more about that that offset with the downs road. Yeah, um, yeah. Or the, the pathway to the downs road. So, um, anyways, I'm sure you guys could figure it out. Yep, that's what we get paid to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, with that, um, do you have any other questions for this board? I don't, does, Guidance? Oh, I just want to say. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Jean. Um, so, when you said the 78 appointments, it's actually half that because there might be 78 people but half of them are working so they're not driving in and out that's all I was trying to but they have the clients are there right their cars are there right but I thought he meant 78 people are driving in and out it could be what my point being you could have an, an influx of a lot of cars coming at one moment a mm -hmm. one o'clock appointment or something and that's where miss a, the, if they're not aligned well, if that distance is too short, you all With sudden, that side street? That yeah. And, yeah. And I worry that that side street, not worry, but, you know, I, I think it's a legitimate um, concern that the that road is going to get busier and busier and busier as this gets built out, um, especially given the most recent discussions about who might be going there for employers and I think any of these little shortcuts 
are going to become very popular because Route 1 and Payne Road and everywhere else. Oh, yeah, you mean from the downs. From the downs, yeah. Correct. So anytime you have a, a drive that's a little offset from that intersection is a risk for creating maybe an accident situation. So. so is that why you were talking about flipping the building to move the driveway? I think she okay. had brought it up as part of uh, two birds, one stone. You can get the okay. you can get the door visible, mm -hmm. and you can get the drive uh, aligned a little bit different. So I just have one question: How does that make the door visible? I guess maybe I'm confused about where, how you want to flip it. It would be visible from coming back from back the colder the other way, right? But like I said, I'm not so stuck on seeing a door as much as I am. We don't know what the street side. <laughs> yeah, yeah what, what it would look like is the short wing would be to the back, or the short part oh, of the L would I be see. to the back, I'm and then the long part would be down the left side. I see. You're saying put this back here. Right, by, by simply okay. flipping the I build, keeping the same. Well, you can keep the same design, flip it, flip it back. And to accommodate the issue of the offset, if you move the building to the left, then you have a driveway that's further down, gives people more of a chance to turn in, turn out, and, and perhaps also get back to, to the downs. Um, and by doing that, all of a sudden, the entrance is right there. It's right, can stay right exactly where it is in the center, but it is then immediately visible from the road. I trust that the, their team can, can figure this a little bit better and give us a little bit more detail to, to well, look I at. I think Anne's point originally was she thought it would just look aesthetically a lot nicer, seeing because the it's going to be all windows. So looking at this building with all windows would look nicer than looking at a bunch of cars going down the road. So the cars would be behind. So I think that was kind of her part of our idea, is that true? You'll come up with something. Yeah, we'll come up with something. Yeah, design, design standards, yeah. you know, as long as you're, you're in that ballpark, you know, we're, as you know, Jason, you know, we've, we've of course, worked with clients, um, applicants. So, all right. See you in a few weeks. Yeah, I think, uh, well, I think I, well, well, you won't see us in three weeks because the submission was today, but. So six weeks. Six yeah. weeks. So. Good luck to you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We are now. We've lost the agenda. Yep. And we are on to staff report, please. Uh, I don't think I have anything to report at this hour. <laughs> <laughs> An hour ago, there was a plenty to talk about. Yeah, uh, administrative amendment report. I was not updated on any, so I don't think you and Jamel have done any in the last three weeks. That's correct. I have not done any. Although, I, I guess one thing I should report on, um, uh, now that I'm thinking about it, you may have noticed um, Town and Country, uh, their, their main office, sort of back off uh, Little mm -hmm. Dolphin Drive, out behind... Um, Route 1 there, um, they've started the second phase of development. Board members may recall, I think at least three or four of you were on the board when the site was originally approved. Uh, they came in for two phases. They built the first phase of the building. Now they're going in and doing the second phase, which is essentially a mirror of what's existing there. So um, you probably see some steel up and things are happening. So Does that do any blasting for that? Uh, so the foundation was already in. Oh, right. uh, frankly, it's been six, seven, eight years, uh, maybe not that long, five or six years since they built. I don't remember if there was any blessing at that time. I, I, I don't recall. I think it's original because I had talked to him. He had to do some blasting for the original one. He may have. And they found some cracks further down. I mean, just what happens when you blast. Mm -hmm. It came up when we were doing the public safety building. Gotcha. Uh, correspondence. Mine. I'm still looking at yours. Planning board comments. I'll just say thank you guys. Um, looking forward to another full year here, and um, it's a good team. So I think everyone here does a very, very nice job. 
um, and we all bring uh, some great perspective and some, some really, really nice strengths to this uh, community. So thank you all for serving again. Um, adjournment. Oh, yeah, I, I just want to say that um, our, our system of workshops has worked very well. Uh, and I, if the paper is correct, the newspaper is correct, the amount of work that's going to start coming through this board is going to be tremendous. Um, and I think at one point in Scarborough, I, I was told the town council requested that we meet every two weeks the board meet every two weeks rather than every three weeks because of the press of the work. I don't, I don't, you know, I, who, we have no control over that if the town council asks us to do that. But um, according to the, uh, according to the paper, there are nine lots sold at the, uh, or uh, under contract at Innovation, plus WEX coming through, plus the ancillary businesses that will all of a sudden just uh, start pouring in. So I really appreciate the way we've been a team, and uh, we're going to really need to continue to do that and work together because I think this this next year it's going to be quite a challenge. Are you asking for hazard pay? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I was asking for regular pay. Regular didn't, pay yeah, you. you mean you guys are getting paid? Wait a minute. <laughs> let's, let's start with just basic pay, right? Minimum minimum wage. All right. Well, point well taken. We are going to be busy, um, and I think also uh, along the workshop thoughts, uh, keeping downs probably in more of a workshop format is saving us some valuable uh, meeting time here for all of the other applicants that keep coming through so stay tuned we'll be busy oh, I, I do have a question down in uh, uh, village what's that new building yeah. it's a nail salon Oh, yes, one, that's what I've been told by the people who have been there. waiting for it to yep. open. So it's a small, yep, there's, I think there's actually two tenant spaces. I think there's going to be a small office space in there, maybe uh, retail or something to that effect, as well as personal service. Yep. Yeah, it can be for us. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, about, uh, it, when, we, uh, when we approved the table and tap, I think at this, pretty much at the same time we approved a of couple of commercial buildings right along there. With that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. I have a second. Yep. All in favor. Thank you again, everyone.